but we've been given two paths, right? One is you are your feelings. It's the only, it's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. However you feel on a given day is, is what <laughs> my favorite phrase right now. And I say that ironically is your truth. Yeah. Like that's a, that's not a thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you are your feelings. You are whatever you feel in this moment. And we're going to go that route. The other side is equally insidious is if you have feelings, it's because you're weak mm-hmm. and you're a coward. You need to suck it up, grind it and kill it. And so for me, it's a third path, which is you got to feel this stuff and then you have to go act, right? You still got to go do what's right, right? So it's a context, not an excuse. And so go do what you got to do, even if you don't feel like it. John, thanks for coming on uh, the show, man. I wanted to open by talking, because off air, we're talking a little bit about your background. Yeah. Fascinating. So before you became this like media personality that's yeah. exploded, yeah. What were you doing before? I was a nerd, man. Uh, I was a dean of students at universities, and I was working with college kids and their families. And I was a professor. Just a, I was just a dude. I was a nerd. And um, in the evenings, my old man was a SWAT hostage negotiator and a homicide detective in Houston growing up. And so I always had this, when things went down in the city, he always had this little cocky grin, and he'd put his bulletproof vest on, and he would go into into what was going on. So I just kind of was raised with that. And I thought that's kind of like when your dad's like, whatever your dad does, you think it's just the way that is. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, I started working crisis response with, with victim services units, what they called it. But I would show up in the middle of the night and sit with people who do help with death notifications, sit with people whose kids had taken their life. And now you got a mother figuring out what, what, what happens next or, um, somebody's husband passes away or wife passed away. And so just sitting with people when the wheels had fallen off and that's, that's been my career. And then I gave a speech at this event and here now, yeah. now as my son says, dad, you're not that cool. You're a YouTuber now. So what's the show about? Oh man, that's hard brother. What's up? Hey, what are you doing? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney show. What's happening? We say the show's about mental health and relationships, how to live a well life. Listen, take yourself out to dinner. It is rare that I hear a new one, and that's a new one, so well done. So the show can go anywhere at any time. On today's show, we talk to a woman who's in love with a hypochondriac, and it's so hard, to a dad who's trying to teach body positivity to his young daughters, dealing with big T trauma and family history, to a sister whose brother-in-law has screwed up everything, and we talk to a young mom whose husband keeps making sexual jokes around the kids. Whoa! Stay tuned. That's what he says, man. <laughs> how, do you, how do you stay mentally um, healthy helping because I, and I've had conversations with friends yeah. and family through tough times and it really affects me. It's really challenging. Yep. And I, I feel it for a while yeah. to do something like that means you simultaneously care a lot about helping people, but then you're able to also, I mean, what do you, do you have to compartmentalize that? Like, how does that work? I think, you, I think in the moment you got to compartmentalize it because you got to show up and be with somebody. And I think this idea of distance doesn't help people when you're hurting and somebody's with you, but they're not with you, yeah. right? Someone's sitting with you uh, when your spouse is with you and they're on their phone, you know that they're not with you, right? Yeah. And so when you show up and somebody's kid has died, you got to be all in. Mm-hmm. I think it's the process on the back end, right? I have to have a process, whatever that is. And everybody's looks different, <laughs> but you have to, you have to say, I'm setting that brick down and I got to go be with my family. Are there, are there, are there uh, commonalities in people's successful processes with dealing with things like this to be able to Yeah, other people, life? physical movement, you got to get sleep. You got to do all the things upstream to keep your body healthy so you can show up in these hard moments and then Uh-oh. get back out. And you can look at police officers who've been doing that for 30 years and they're overweight and they're exhausted mm. and they eat most of their meals in their car, right? Or um, our buddies who come home from overseas, you get that crew that just like goes straight to the gym yeah. and you get those that just kind of dad it out. Right. And then their bodies wear that. So yeah, I think you got to take care of yourself. Um, but the big deal is I had a supervisor who would call every night, 2 AM I'm headed home dealing with, you know, two small dead toddlers. Ugh. He'd call, say, what'd you see? How are you? Tell me what your body's feeling. Call me tomorrow. And so it was always this human to human check-in and then you can say it out loud. Wow. So, I mean, you were following your dad to these crisis situations? Like no, 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 how, no, oh. no, no. I was a little kid just watching it happen. Okay. And then that inspired you to then That's right. yeah, make yeah. that your career. Yeah. How old were you when you decided like, okay, this is something I want to pursue? I wanted to be a, a psychologist when I was a little kid and I wanted oh, wow. to be a, a, in the FBI. I, was one, I saw my man was a homicide detective and I was like, the cooler thing would be the FBI. Yeah. And then in 20, it was uh, August of 20, 2001. I went and met with a guy, some guru, and he's like, 
FBI is starting this big downsizing process. They're never going to hire you. Go find something else. And then 9-11 happened. And it's been like this massive hire. I mean, but I just took a, a different path. Wow, interesting. Good. So the last, uh, for someone like you, the last few years must have been both, uh, I guess, interesting because you're in this like laboratory of insanity for the last <laughs> yeah. few years. Yeah, for sure. But also kind of like, I, I must have been a whirlwind. Like, can you explain your, your like, what's that been for you f being an expert yeah, yeah. in mental health? Also being in the limelight and having to do that too, yeah. which is probably a little bit different than being able to handle one-on-one. -on -one. Like when you say things now, you probably have that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I've got millions of people that are going to listen to me too when I say this. I can't go there or it'll shut me down. Oh, really? So it's a big deal for me that like we're just four guys having a conversation and like three cool guys I just met who were super hospitable. We're just going to hang out for a couple hours mm -hmm. and talk about like, I'm, I'm excited to learn from you guys, right? If I start thinking, dude, I wonder how many people and I need to sit like this so that oh, yeah. I'll go oh, crazy, yeah. right? <laughs> sure. And so the joke I always say is... Um, uh, Kelly, the show producer, she's just taking what I've been doing for 20 years, just putting those phone calls. Now she just puts them on the internet mm -hmm. and I got to go about my day. And so, uh, yeah, I, I stay pretty, pretty disassociated from all that. I, I have to, I, I can't plug into it. What's up y'all. Here's the giveaway maps anabolic, the program that started it all. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won at Maps Anabolic. Again, that's the program that started it all. Also, we got a sale going on right now. Map cool. Starter, a beginner strength training program. For, so if you're just getting started, that program is 50% off. And then the Prime Bundle. This includes Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro. It's all about correctional exercise, all about mobility. That is also 50% off. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code AUGUST50 for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes a show. What What are the skills necessary, you think, for someone like you to do what you do? What mm -hmm. makes you good at what you do? Can I tell you, I, I've been wrestling with that because I've been introduced. I had no social media before I took this job. I didn't, I didn't have any of it. And uh, I've always thought it was a cancer. Like it just would mm -hmm. pull, I watched my students over the arc of 20 years. It just pulled their souls up from them, right? Like a Dementor, like a, I got little kids, a Harry Potter thing, like a, <laughs> like a Harry Potter character. Um and so now I've been introduced in the last couple of years to this thing called the influencer, whatever that is. It, 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 it's, <laughs> it's a dirty it's, word. It, well, it's wild. Yeah. It, Cause I'll like, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, and where did you get, <laughs> come up with that info? Yeah. And so I've been trying to think like, what is wisdom? And this, y'all pitch in on this. It's somebody who's walked their own journey, had to look in the mirror and deal with their own demons. They've got the academic insight. They, they read the studies. They know what they're talking about when it comes to the info. And then I think equally important you will have walked alongside a bunch of other people doing it too, right? So I can have my own, I can go lift weights and know how my body responds to this diet and this lifting in the morning versus evening. But if I've done it with 200 people and I've got a bigger sample size and if I read the data, right, then I can, that's a wise person, right? So I think you have to have all three of them. I would, I would add to that from, from the, the research I've done on you and listening to you talk, I think you're a master communicator too. I think that takes, and I don't know if you, reps, that's just reps. Is it just reps? I'm gonna say, I don't know if you actively are trying to be better at that or you've read a lot or that's just natural for you. But, you know, the ability to talk to people in a situation like they're most of the people you get, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're very empathetic. You're mm -hmm. very smart with the way you choose the words that you choose when you're describing them. I mean, a lot of these people are in a, a very uh, tense emotional state and mm -hmm. so how you communicate them is so i mean it reminds me of b being a trainer and you got somebody who is broken and they've put on all this weight and they're trying to solve this problem and they think it's a a numbers thing and you know that there's something mm -hmm. deeper there and it, but to get to that it it takes a lot of skill to like navigate to pull that out i think you do that really oh, i appreciate that yeah really really well I, th to me the two guiding words are with not at and so mm -hmm. if if i'm somebody's if i show up to somebody's house and their toddler's passed away in the next room and i can tell you here's a good example man this is a terrible this is just me um hating on myself my wife um we had hank and then we had a period of a couple of years of just miscarriage and then another one and then the third one was was an ectopic pregnancy it ruptured and i married an old tough west texas farm girl she was like this isn't happening and she tried to flex through it right and almost bled out in our house wow and lucky for her, she was married to a crisis expert, like a trauma guy. Mm. And so I had, dude, I would tell her, this is like shameful. I would tell her 
what she should be feeling. I would tell her what she should be thinking. I would say like, I mean, you can cry, but your body's just doing, I gave her all the charts and graphs mm -hmm. and I completely missed, right? And that was an inside of my house moment. Dude, you show up to the middle of the night with somebody, somebody calls you on my show or whatever, you are with them. The at stuff, like I'm not giving you, you need to do 10 reps and you do this many sets and that, that somebody's coming to you who's like, can you help me? I, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't stand what I see in the mirror anymore. My marriage is falling yeah. apart because of my, the way I look, I'm going to be with you. And now I'm going to hear what you have to say, right? I can see it on you. You clearly know what you're talking about. Can we, can you be with me on this? And then you say, here's what you, here's what we need to do. And all right, I'll do that. Right. Wow. So it's, that's, that's the shift. I think. Yeah. John, you hmm. mentioned wisdom. I want to go there because uh, I remember, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the internet uh, went from nobody used it to it just really exploded. And all of a sudden we had access to, I mean, all theoretically, right. All of recorded human history mm -hmm. at our fingertips. Yeah. And I remember as a trainer, uh, talking with clients about this and I was young. So I thought, I said, oh man, we're going to see incredible progress because mm -hmm. the, all of our problems are going to be solved because we're going to have all the knowledge. All right. We're going to have all the knowledge. It's going to be at our fingertips and it's going to be just this utopia. And, and what ended up happening is we have flat earth <laughs> society. <laughs> that grew. Sasquatch believers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's real. That's different. That's Come the government. On, did they land that. on the moon? <laughs> <laughs> I think they did. Sasquatch is yeah. on the moon? I think exactly. Yeah. But we, we have all this knowledge, mm -hmm. but we don't have the wisdom and the knowledge is exploding far faster then the wisdom can grow because wisdom takes time. Yeah. And you working with students, what are some of the, I guess, what are the effects of this? Have you, have you, and, and am I saying yes. anything that's accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, if I think about like violence and pornography and things like that, here's what shifted in all of human history. If you witnessed violence, you were there, mm. you participated in it or you watched it and you got to see, remember we were kids and there'd be a fight yeah. mm -hmm. and you'd hear somebody get hit it, it rippled through the, like, I don't want any, like it made violence very visceral and real or to see a naked body 150 years ago, you had to be in the vicinity of a naked body. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now what we have is we have a bunch of folks who are able to get data, right? I could see a photo of somebody. I could see lots of violence. I can see, you know, Keanu Reeves running around shooting guns sideways on horses with swords or whatever. And I get a, I get the, the insight, the picture of what that looks like but I'm missing what that means. Oh, wow. And so we've probably are all old enough to have burned an entire movie trying to like reach over and like, are we going to grab her hand? Like, and it's too close. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna get close enough, but not to, I don't want to be right. And you just, I don't even know what movie's on. Like I'm trying to, yeah. all that's all, oh, over. There was an arc to it, right? There's an arc to intimacy. There's an arc to violence. Shut up. I'm not shutting up. You shut Like there's an arc to it. And now it's just instant, right? It's just instant, instant, instant. And so I think we have shot past our body's ability to absorb this insight, this knowledge. And by the way, it keeps coming too fast, man. It's just like an, it's an avalanche. This wow, is such a fascinating, mm. this is a fascinating conversation because we talk about this, all, we all have kids, right? Yeah, so yeah. thinking about our kids and I know you have two kids, yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, how do you, how do you communicate that to your kids or what are you doing right now to try and help them through that process? Because you know how important that was in the role of you understanding all those, situ all those things. What, what do you communicate that to your kids right now? Or are you just aware of how much screen time they're consuming? Like, how do you manage that as, as a parent? So this is awesome. Um, so I graduated in 2010 with my big fancy education PhD. I thought I was, was y'all know that guy that like gets the letters and like has to tell her, like, I was the worst. Man. I was the worst. I was like an <laughs> arrogant idiot, dude. And then I, I had my own struggles with mental health stuff. I was watching my students melt. My marriage was hanging on by dental floss. So I ended up, I was working at a university that just gave you a free class, like uh, every semester. And so I nickel and dime my way to a second PhD in counseling. I wanted to know what is happening to me. It wasn't to get the certificate. It was like, I need to figure out what's going on, oh, wow. dude. As a part of that, as an old guy, I had to go back and be an intern. I had to be, do a practicum. And I did it with this child psychologist who was a savant. His name is uh, Michael Gomez. He works at Brown now. He's a, he, I mean, his head's a hundred times faster than mine. And we were going from room to room working with, traumatized kids, sexually abused kids. And I also had, a, my son was really little at the time. And so I was asking these veiled counseling questions, but I was really asking like dad advice yeah. questions. And we were with one little boy who was saying some crazy things about women. Like I couldn't believe they were coming out of this little boy's mouth. Clearly he had picked this up from his environment. Right. And so we were walking from room to room and I asked Dr. Gomez like, what are you supposed to say to a little boy 
to uh, teach him to respect women. He's like, what do you say? And he's, he caught on real quick and he smiled at me and he goes, you can tell him whatever you want to, but he's just going to watch you. Right. And mm. I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, kids don't listen to you. They watch you. And I was like, oh no. Right. Because I was sarcastic. Me and my wife were always poking at each other. And that's how my son was picking it up. So I tell you that to tell you, it's a big deal. He's got to go be involved and put his hands on stuff, yeah. right? It's the reason why I take him hunting with me, even <laughs> though it <laughs> cuts our opportunity for success. It, it 90% chance we're going to fail. Cause I got a seven year old banging pots and pans, like walking on a, right. <laughs> we're not, nothing's going to happen, but I want him to understand what it feels like to get up early and to work real hard and to plan for something and to honor an animal. Mm. Right. I bring him along those things. We bring him to funerals. I don't hide that stuff from him. And I'd rather him have interaction time with me than get it from a video game. Right. right. Or get it from a screen. Wow. Right. So yeah. You, you mentioned uh, getting the information, but not, um, I guess for lack of a better term, feeling yeah. through the body. And, and we've never separated the two in human history. They've always been connected. They have to be. Yeah. But now they're separate. Right. And I, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now. I'm in the, I'm, all, I'm just in the beginning. I think it's called the, the Body Keeps the Score. I'm not sure. Yeah, if you're it's familiar a masterpiece. With that. Yeah. Okay. So great book. Uh -huh. And the author talks about how processing trauma, like you can, you can try to block it off, but if you don't process it physically or go mm -hmm. through it. Um, or there's this process of, of of moving through this trauma. It'll never get processed. It gets stored right. in the body. Your body holds it. Yeah. Is there is that something similar that's happening when we're doing things like you, you mentioned pornography, for mm -hmm. example, separating the, you know, before I had to meet someone and I had to, you know, I had to flirt with them and then win them over. And then there's this whole thing that goes. Now we don't have that. We just look at pictures or videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. What's happening by well, separating I mean, the, the two? There's hormones and chemical. Right. So your heart beats a little bit faster and the oxytocin releases and the dopamine. Like all of that is. Um, it's out the window. It's a, it's a, it's a fire hose now. Mm. Right. And you, your brain can't keep up with it and it's not designed to keep up with that. It, right. It's designed to have this slow, this, this slow build to it. Um, the part about the trauma, the way I like to ex explain it, Vander Kolk's so much smarter. <laughs> the guy's a savant, um, uh, is your body puts GPS pins and things like you're a little kid and you hear dad drive up, you know, I should probably, I'm just gonna get small. Right. Or he's gonna come and swing and I got to get between him and mom and dad. I mean, between him and, and mom and, and little brother, mm. your heart's just being a little faster. The cortisol starts pumping and you just start feeling that. And then you fast forward 10 years and your wife drives up and in, in that same, your body remembers it. Oh, I see. It's like, okay, here comes the car, a little adrenaline. And your wife comes in you're like, I don't know why I'm tense. I don't know why I'm like, but you are, and it must be her fault. And I start looking for why is this her fault? And it could be the shoes on the floor. And so now we're, we're in a dance and she knows whenever I'm like this, she remembers that right from her, her little GPS is like when dad's shoulders go up, you better back up and get small. And so now we're in a dance that kept us alive when we were kids. And now it's causing a problem here. And so I think that, yeah, that body remembers everything. And it also doesn't remember things that it didn't have access to. Right. Oh, wow. So, so if you didn't way. have relate, like trauma is affirmative. It happened to you. And it's also things that didn't happen that should have. Someone should have told you that you had value and that you were worth being loved when you were a kid. So um, is it safe to say that these are essentially survival shortcuts that are created? And when I say shortcuts, meaning they're processed in the parts of the brain that are Keep designed to be fast. And they're scanning 24-7, 365. Okay. And yeah. the frontal lobe, right? That's the- That's the, the that's a slow. I mean, yeah, that's the, executive old, that's the old man. That's the wisdom. Okay. And yeah. that's when you try to explain it afterwards. Oh, it must be my wife's fault. Or, yeah, oh, it's yeah, probably yeah, this. Yeah. yeah. Because you're trying to process this automatic- How the heck do you stop that? That's, all, all, that's why we've become so obsessed as a culture with mindfulness. All that is, is listening to the- Slowing like, it down, yeah. Whoa, what, why is my body taking off on me right now? Mm. It's just that small break of curiosity. You've heard that thing between the stimulus and response, that gap. Yes. We call it, if I can just sit there, like my heart's beating faster. My wife's driving up. I love her. She's awesome. I can't wait till she gets home. And then you ask her, like, what am I, what's my body trying to protect me from? Mm. And it could be, oh, I didn't put, I threw socks on the floor. Or it could be something as benign as that. Or we need to have a hard conversation that I've been avoiding. Or... I just need to learn that when she comes home, it's all good. And we make so much character judgment, we get all pissed off and raged out instead of just being curious about it, man. Interesting. So the, hmm. the what I what comes to me in terms of like one of the most challenging steps is just to be aware that that's happening. That's it, man. Yeah. How do you, are there practices somebody could have? <laughs> is it listening to people you care about and be like, maybe I should believe my wife when she says I act a particular way instead of defending myself? Or like, what would be a good way to try to become To aware? me, the magic is when my, like, yeah. Oh gosh, it sounds so woo woo, dude. Like we should just gonna roll out yoga masks. That's okay. <laughs> start burning incense <laughs> in here. Right. Um, I I think we have in our pursuit of info, of mm -hmm. knowledge, wisdom is um, things I can read in a book. 
we have completely discounted what our body's trying to tell us, right? Something like anxiety, like it's just your body trying to get your attention, man. It's not a, it's not a thing to be solved. It's just as, a, as an alarm system. And so it's listening to that smoke alarm going off, right? Why is, why is my heart beating faster? Why am I getting pissed off all of a sudden? My wife just told me, I need you to help. Can you go downstairs? Here's what's happening the other day. Can you go downstairs and grab something? I was clearly in the middle of another project. She's like, hey, can you go get the dog food out of the car downstairs in the, in the basement? I got mad. Like my body was like, <laughs> and then I thought, why am I, why? What am I getting mad? I'm outside working on, we're building this big old garden and she didn't stop and appreciate me and all the work I've done <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this Tennessee heat. That's what that was about. It had nothing yeah. to do with helping my wife. And it took me eight, 8.8 seconds to think through that and then go go help out, mm. man. Like, because what am I going to get from that? Yeah, but that's it. So, but that's, that's a, years of practice. I was just yeah. going to say yes. of, of thinking to yourself. So we're disconnected from our bodies, essentially. You know what's yeah. weird? What, what totally came to mind when you said that is I remember specifically there was a moment, and then this happened a, a few times after I had learned the how to teach my clients how to belly breathe. So I had learned this through somebody that I worked mm -hmm. with who, you know, she taught meditation, and I saw value in belly breathing to get my clients to have better form with exercise at okay. some points. Okay. Cause it would bring their sympathetic system, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it would yeah. get them in this more kind of relaxed state yeah. and we could do mobility and stuff. And I remember it was like one of the first times I did this, I got this client, I had her come in, I took her in this room. I used to have a wellness studio and I turned the lights down. Cause I remember that's what I learned. Mm -hmm. I turned the lights down a little bit, <laughs> turn off the music. So it's quiet. And I taught her how to belly breathe. And the yeah. way I taught her was I'd have her lay on the floor, one hand on her belly, one hand on her chest. And I said, make sure that the hand on the belly rises first before oh, the God. chest. And then, so I walked through this process. And we did this and that like 10 belly breaths. And this one was totally fine when she came in. She started crying. She started crying, yeah, yeah. And I, I was like, uh oh, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, I had yeah, no yeah. idea what I did. I didn't yeah. know how to, whatever. And so, and then that happened again. And I talked to my friend and I said, why are they crying when I'm having them belly breathe? And mm. she said, well, they're processing emotions that they stored in their body. And I thought that was the craziest, weirdest thing I ever heard. That's for sure. Yeah. So, and that's kind of what, ha what happened. Is that, that is, is what's happening there? Or is that just the, the transition from you switching from, the, how your brain is processing information. Like, I don't know how familiar or letting you are, yourself feel it familiar with like Daniel Kahneman's work and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like, yeah. and what he did with the thinking fast oh, and thinking yeah, slow. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. is that what's happening? Is it, is that that person maybe is like always in the monkey brain uh, of like yeah. fast thinking. And then all of a sudden you get them to breathe down and then they transition. And then for the first time ever, they have to like really process and think about yeah. things. Is that what's it? I, I don't know enough about the, the thinking physiology, how the, like how it, it switches from this thinking to this thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, I, on a, just a basic level, I know the body holds emotions and I know that we are coached in our current culture to not let them out. And if you let them out, then you are somehow dysfunctional. You're not in control. You're a coward. You're weak or whatever you want to say. And so there's something important about, uh, important about learning how to feel feelings. Right. And that sounds like the cheesiest, lamest thing. But if I can't acknowledge out loud, I'm pissed off, then I can't possibly get to the other side of that and ask myself, why am I mad? Mm. Which then is going to lead me into, oh, because I'm acting like a whiny baby because I want my wife to pat me on the back for things that, A, I agreed to do, B, were my idea, and C, <laughs> I, I moved us to Tennessee. I know it's hot out. I don't need to get an award for this. Like, I can never get there if I can't acknowledge in the first place that it's not her but that I'm the one, I'm the only one who can decide I'm going to be frustrated about things. Now, how good are you, um, once you piece that together, yeah. how good are you as a husband of coming back and communicating that? That's And how important is that? It, it was us sitting down and saying, are we going to keep, are we going to stay married? Oh, wow. I mean, it took that. And then from there, it was like, okay, then this is what has to be different. Um, and so I'm pretty good about it now, but I wasn't for the first 10 or 15 years we were married. It's, wow. it's, it takes practice. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the magic word. And you also use that in your book, which it's, if we would shift the, that dude's weak or that dude sucks or that dude's super lame, we'd make yeah. these character issues and say, no, that dude's practicing because he didn't have a picture from what his old man gave him. He didn't have, there's no pictures in the media of what masculinity looks like in a healthy way. Like he's practicing this and let's get there. And if I tell my wife, I'm practicing coming back. I used to tell my students when I would call them in and be like, hey, uh, they found like a brick of heroin in your room. You're selling heroin. And I would always stop and say, I just, I just called you in here cold, asked you a hard question. And you're probably going to tell me, no, this isn't mine. It's your roommates. That's cool. You get 24 hours to circle back in here and tell me the truth of what happened. And then I'm going to take it as though you told me the truth now. And if I find out you're being dishonest with me, we're going to have a way bigger problem because I don't mind sending some, well, if you're selling a brick of heroin, that's a whole other thing, but I don't mind sending somebody out who, who makes a stupid 20 year old mistake. I don't want to put my 
university certificate on your wall if you're not a person of integrity. Mm. Different conversation. And so I'd give people 24 hours because I know that they're 18 and they're practicing integrity, right? They're mm. practicing telling the truth when they're when things are hard. And so if we can shift that language to practice, man, it changes everything, I think. Do you find differences in communicating, uh, generally speaking, uh, to men and women when it comes to <laughs> trauma? I mean, we're, oh, I, I think yeah, traditionally, yeah, okay, yeah. so yeah, maybe you can go, go into that a little bit. What do you think? Um, it's just, it's, I've, we've, we've been given two paths, right? One is you are your feelings. It's the only, it's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. However you feel on a given day is, is what <laughs> my favorite phrase right now. And I say that ironically is your truth. Yeah. Like that's a, that's not a thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you are your feelings. You are whatever you feel in this moment. And we're going to go that route. The other side is equally insidious is if you have feelings, it's because you're weak mm-hmm. and you're a coward. You need to suck it up, grind it and kill it. And so for me, it's a third path, which is you got to feel this stuff and then you have to go act, right? You still got to go do what's right, right? So it's a context, not an excuse. And so, yes, I'm talking to men. It's if I have a feeling, my wife doesn't want to hear me have feelings. And I'm like, dude, that's all she wants you to have, <laughs> right? And the other side of it is, is like, I just need to keep, uh, uh, I can't get up and do anything because I'm just so, I don't feel it. I'm not motivated. I don't feel, okay, cool. You don't feel motivated. Awesome. You said you were going to get the workout in today. You said you're going to tell your mm-hmm. wife you were sorry. You said you're going to go apologize to your child for, for, um, for being too aggressive. Like go do what you got to do, even if you don't feel like it. Right. So it's both and man. Mm, yeah. This is uh this is uh, my wife and I do this a lot and we learn a lot from each other. Tell me about that. that. Oh, same thing. I mean, I'm, I am much better at it now, but yeah. I didn't even know I had certain feelings. I didn't even acknowledge mm. that I had certain feelings, and she'd bring it up. I'm like, no, I don't. That doesn't bother me. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, she's like, oh, are you sure? All right, we'll see. Let's let's see if it, <laughs> if, if you really do, you don't. But here's your behaviors. And so, did your wife ever have this thing like where maybe y'all, when y'all were dating or first married, y'all would be out at a club or out, out with friends, whatever, and she would just gently put her hand on your arm and say, "We need to go." Mm. And my wife, I come to find out years later, she's like, I could tell by your jaw, oh, yeah. like the way you're holding your mouth, that there yeah. was about to be a problem yeah. or that I saw somebody do a thing that I saw you see it. We should probably go. Yeah. And I was like, no, man, why are you? <laughs> but she's like, I could feel your sadness. I could feel your anger. I could feel your frustration on you before you don't even know what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I can feel it on you. And then she's acting like my con. She's like, we should probably go. And that's taken me 20 years to develop that voice in my own head. Yeah. You know, it's, there's a test that I, maybe this is, I don't know if it's true or false, but I remember reading about this test uh, where they have a picture of just eyes. So it's a face, but they just show the eyes and you have to try to guess the emotion. And men apparently are notoriously terrible at it. Yeah. And women are really, really good at being able to read the emotions. Okay, but think about that. Think about that, like, evolutionarily. Like, we got bigger. Like, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I've not read that. At Paul Ekman's work, remember the, like, the face reader? There was, like, a TV show about it. Okay. Um, where he's real good about reading, like, the whole psychology of, of the face um, and emotions. But it makes sense to me that if you, kids are notoriously good at um, especially kids from abused households at reading body language because they have to. Oh, right. I got to get out of here or this isn't safe or he's about to hit little Susie and I got to get between them. And so it doesn't make, it doesn't surprise me that over eons, women who are smaller, don't have as big of muscles and have to protect themselves. And so they get really good at, mm. I got to know from just from your eyes, whether I'm safe or not. That makes sense. Interesting. Speaking of reading faces, um, and you talked about kids here, mm. and obviously we know children's brains are, mm. I mean, our brains are always plastic, but yeah, they're yeah. very, very plastic when we're little. I mean, they yeah. just, they, uh, they grow and change so rapidly based on their environments, based off the research that I've, that yeah, I've read. Yeah, big time. We just recently went through a period where, um, and I, I, this is my opinion, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. but I think, I'm, I think I'm right on this, yeah. that we had some knee-jerk fear-based reactions to a pandemic where we forced mm-hmm. children, really young children, yeah to wear masks yeah. over their faces. And I, I was very vocal about this on our show. And I said, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea. First off, you know, a four-year-old, it's hard to keep a four-year-old to keep their socks on, let alone a mask <laughs> properly. But also like they're around other kids. They can't read facial expressions. Yeah. That probably is going to have some effects uh, mentally or socially. Are we seeing any of that? Or, or what are your opinions on that? I think, um, so I like to take the, uh, the emotion part out of it even if it was the greatest right thing to do. Meaning, um, if I'm driving down the highway and a semi is coming at me and there's a Volkswagen Beetle next to me, I'm going to swerve and hit that Volkswagen Beetle and we're going to come to a crashing stop. It's not a good thing. 
it was better than getting hit head on by a semi, right? right? So taking out, whether it was right or wrong or stupid or whatever, we did it, right? And I think the fact that we did it's going to be a hundred year issue. Really? Because you got kids development, you've got brain development, and we don't know. It's just a dice roll. Um, I, I haven't been able to parse through the literature that doesn't just feel partisan to me. And so where I go whenever that happens is back to the wisdom conversation is just teachers. And that's, I was a high school teacher for a few years before I worked in higher ed. My wife is a, was a researcher for on teachers and education and pedagogy. Like, so that's our world is teachers. And they're the ones telling me language development's different, auditory stuff, like not being able to hear and see mm -hmm. words and, and things for, and mouth form. Um, kids that got comfortable behind that mask, right? Yeah, you see that now. It's wild. I see areas where you don't even have to wear a mask. I see this all the time now where I'll see the adults. The kid feels less safe. And the kid's still wearing a mask. Yeah. And then the parents aren't in like, and then I remember Sal telling John, me. that happened to my daughter. So my Mine too, mine too. Okay. I, so had to, I had to tell her, you have to take this off. Hmm. And it wasn't a mean thing. It was, she had developed, it was just like the kid who wears their hair in front of their face, yeah, right? Yes. It, as a way of protecting themselves from the world, you have to face this, right? And so, yeah, we had to do that. Yeah, same thing, because it was, I mean, the formidable years. My, my daughter was in, I think, uh, was it fifth grade, uh, fourth or fifth grade when it started. And so, you know, four, uh, fifth, sixth, right? Then they took off the mandate. We're here in California, so they mm -hmm. lasted for a long time here. Mm -hmm. Then they took, but all of them continued to wear them. Right. And I and I could tell that she, it was like she was hiding yeah. almost. It's like, how do I, you know, and, and hopefully when they go back, they'll mm -hmm. take them off. It feels like to me that we were actually heading for the Volkswagen and we might have swerved into the semi. Well, we may have, <laughs> just, we may have swerved Not, so hard to hit the Volkswagen and we both went off the side of the yeah, bridge, right? That's what and, I feel like. I, I mean, I get the the analogy. I think it's such a great way to put it, but I think what we're going to find out down the mm -hmm. road is that we we we, you know, we missed the Volkswagen. Here's the, we, the bigger thing for me has been watching like – We'll figure out what ha what we did to their neurology. We'll figure that out, right? And I also don't want to discount kids are notoriously resilient, right? Sure. If they're if and here's the magic part: if they're surrounded by mature adults, mm. and the, I'm way more concerned about the last two years, kids absorbing their parents' tension sure. and rage and mm. anger. That stuff sets long term trauma trends that their bodies will be trying to solve for years and years and years. Right? Yeah. It's just adults acting like children over yeah. the last couple of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what else, John, that I, I saw, um, and I'd, again, I'd love your input on this. And I noticed this as, as a trainer. At one point, I started training a lot of clients in advanced age. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would see some of this uh, with them as well. But I saw some of my grandparents. So when everything first happened, my, my grandfather's 90, my grandmother's uh, mid 80s. And we're, we, I come from a big... Uh, Italian family. Mm -hmm. We're very social. We meet yeah, with each yeah. other quite often and we're always together. But when everything happened, everybody's like, okay, we can't visit grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. We got to stay away to keep them safe. So what we did is we buy them groceries, drop them off at the mm -hmm. door, and, but we didn't see them. And it was about, I would say it was at least a year, maybe a le little less than a year before we finally said, you know what, we need to go mm -hmm. and be with them physically, not FaceTime, but actually be with them yeah. uh, physically. Their health declined and that it was like a 10 month period more yeah. than in the previous like 10 years. Yeah. And it really highlighted to me how valuable, how important us as humans just being, I mean, we're social creatures. Yeah. Did we totally yeah. just discredit that? Like, oh, that's not a big deal. Well, it just became, the, the greatest virtue is isolation. And so it would be like if uh, it became a virtue to not drink water, like, that just became the coolest thing. Like the way you can love your community the best is have no water. It's like, <laughs> okay, man, cool. And we would all be crawling around on the floor because we're dehydrated and we, our bodies can't function. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we cannot. That's where initially I was all good with masks because it put people back in the same room, at least. If that's sure. what it's going to take for us to get back, cool, man. I'll wear a Darth Vader suit if I can be around other people because I know what that does to my physiology, right? Mm -hmm. So that doesn't surprise me at all. And when I talk about the 100-year arc, there's going to be hell to pay as a culture that we let that many people who are elderly die alone. Mm. That's wrong. That's wrong. That we let mothers and sons and fathers sit in hospital beds with nobody, right? For weeks on end. 
man, that's that's a that's a that's a that's a character statement of who we were, right, and who we were. So we, who we restricted are. a bit of uh, facial recognition, but we also, you know, really removed ourselves from hus- human physical contact as well. That's right. So what? And our bodies are co-regulated, right? Yeah. Right. And the value of touch, like how much that's of everything. touch, like goes into like our human psychology. Everything. Um, I, I, one of my professors, she used to work with sexually traumatized kids that were infants. And she would, it was genius, but they were reintroducing, they have to reintroduce touch in a positive way. So it's like a kid who was drowning, they still have to drink water, right? So if they have developed this this water phobia, they got to, I got to reintroduce it. So they would take these little young, young kids and they would just rub their feet with lotion. And what they were doing is taking, I am a safe caregiver and here's what good touch feels like. I got to reintroduce it because it's everything. And then fast forward 15 years later, I was working at one university and during the HR onboarding process, right? You got to go through the whole thing. They recommended the air high five to avoid any any confusion. <laughs> and I remember sitting there going, the dark you're oh no, this is where we are. This is where we are. We are taking oxygen out of human contact and then saying, go do your best. And you, you can't, man. Yeah. You can't. Well, what was that study? Sal, you shared it a long time ago. It you was, want that Soviet study? Yes, the Soviet study. Oh, terrible. the babies, the babies. Yes. Were they just, they, die. they were just. Yeah, so maybe. They maybe die. So what happened in that study? So they, they took kids, maybe explain it. They gave them all the nutrients. And they gave them all like the 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 warmth and all comfort. They just, just took away human touch. Human touch. Yeah, they they divided the group too. They took one group that they actually hugged <laughs> yeah, them and man. held them. The other group they just fed them, and they failed to thrive. Yeah, they just their bodies quit. There's a fascinating study I was just reading the other day about, and it's an old study about showing. So they have these mirror things. So they'll have a screen up with a baby's mom, but it's being videoed, and so mom is responding in real time to what this baby's doing. Mm. The baby can actually hang. It's when they took a picture of a mom's smiling face, put it on the screen, and just left it frozen. And so the baby's seeing mom in her most love, like her most connected and loving, but it wasn't responding. Because there's no... And the baby mm. gets, starts rocking and because it's it's not right. I'm not connected, right? And there's just not this uh, co-regulation there, man. It was powerful. But you got to be in a room with other people. Wow. You got to figure that out. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I I remember reading too of uh, the value of Rough House for fathers and daughters. Yes. Because, and I remember who was it that we had on the show? I can't believe I forgot his name. He's the one that we ran the feminist act. He was part of them uh, early on. I can't think of his name. Dr. uh, Doug will pull it up. And I'm really upset that I can't remember the feminist act. No, no, no. no. He He was was part of this feminist movement. He was part of the feminist movement early on. Uh, And then his, his whole book is, uh, Warren Thank you, Yeah, Warren Fell. Warren Fell. So, and, and okay. he's really talks about the role of fathers and how mm-hmm. important they are in the, in the, yeah. with children. And one thing that he said was it's important for fathers to roughhouse with their daughters because they can it helps them learn that it's okay that a man touches you as so mm-hmm. long as it's safe and it's in a particular way. So mm-hmm. it's not like you're no, don't touch. They yeah. got to know that they can also be touched, but right. also know to discern safe not safe yeah and i thought that was absolutely well, yeah, my mind validated a lot of i mean my my sons are very you know energetic mm-hmm. and rough house like we all the time but what's interesting is the dynamic with like some of their friends that don't get a lot of rough house you could see it right away yeah. in, the, in the way they interact and so they're they're kind of wrestling and their friends don't really know that line they don't yeah. know that line of like where they cross they go too hard and they throttle down they hurt and, yep. they, and, and so and then they also feel like uh my sons are 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 maybe threatening them. And yeah, so they, they yeah. get like this you know, they're, response playing. to that. Yeah. I've got, it's just, I've got an awesome wife, by the way, I'll just caveat this, but we've got a rolled up Olympic wrestling mat in our living room. <laughs> yeah. It's up there That's and awesome. we'll, we'll roll it out. And my daughter's That's six great. and my son's 12. And now he's getting a little bit bigger where I have to like try a little. Like, Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a, that's a critical part of our everyday life is that rough house and that play. I had this experience with my daughter. Um, you, you have daughters? I do. You? Yeah. So so my son is real affectionate, loves hugs from dad. Mm-hmm. And my old man and I, this isn't to bad mouth him, but he side hugged me at our wedding, yeah, like, yeah, at my yeah. wedding. Like that was- That's like, that generation. That was our, yes, right. Yeah. And so I, one of the things is I'm going to tell my kids I love them every day and I'm going to reintroduce touch into my kids' lives. I want my son to feel that mm-hmm. I love him, right? And that- Man, sometimes now he's 12, he smells, he's got hairy legs. Like, I've got to <laughs> lean into that. And, like, I'm hugging myself. Like, yeah. So now we're in it, right? And again, it's, I'm practicing because I, I, I didn't see it done. My daughter would come in and she learned really quick, dad loves hugs. And so, like a great young daughter, she wanted to weaponize that, right? Uh-huh. And so I would say, uh, like, she was three or four, and I'd say, hey, her name's Josephine. And I'd say, Josephine, come give me a hug. And she'd look at me and go, no, dad. <laughs> and 
when she was three or four, I would say, I'm your dad. You have to do what I say. I, and I got bigger muscles than you. Um, we're doing this hug. <laughs> and she would get real rigid and be like, ugh. And it was my wife that said, what are you teaching her? Yeah. That at some point, some man is going to say, I want your body. And I got bigger muscles than you. Oh, You're going to wow. do what I say. And I was like, same thing oh, happened to me. Oh, and so then I had to go through, it was a year of, hey, come give me a hug. No, daddy. All right. I love you. And I'd go in my room and be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but, this is Sal's wow. story but right now <laughs> it is, the, the switch has flipped. Mm -hmm. And now, man, it's like I've got like an extra arm. Like she's on me. All, but it, it took, this guy's safe. Yes. This guy's safe. Mm -hmm. And I want to teach her, when you say no, you mean no. And so I don't care what dude it is, including your dad, they're going to they're gonna honor so, that. Same thing mm -hmm. with my daughter is I would just say, no, oh, give me a kiss. Come on. I want you know, whatever. And then my wife was like, she needs to know that it, her body, she could say no. And I, it was that light like, bulb, right? Oh my <laughs> God. I was like, I got kicked in the groin. Yeah, oh, dude. Shit. You're yeah. right. So then she says, no, I'm like, you know what? It's your body. You can yeah, say yeah. no whenever you want, but yeah. I love you. And then she's same thing. She'd come find me afterwards and give me. Uh, well, here's the, the other switch. I realized I was giving, <laughs> I was giving a six year old permission to hurt my feelings. <laughs> Six. Yeah. We don't let them drink. We don't let them drive. We don't let them buy lottery tickets. Yet I was giving a six-year-old yeah. who has no executive function insight. Into, so it was like a light switch for me. Like you don't have permission to hurt my feelings anymore. Yeah. Like you're my kid, and if I if you feel responsible for the emotional regulation of the adults in your life, no kid can carry that weight. Yeah. It's too yeah. much. Yeah. And so I got to be responsible for my grown-up feelings. And so if my daughter says no, Dad, then I can think okay. And occasionally I'm like, that sucks, man. She should love her yeah. dad. She does. And also she's six. And so she's pulling a move, dude. It's yeah. fine. I'm not going to lose it. And I'm not going to create long-term trauma over something so silly as that yeah. engagement. No, you know, what's interesting mm. about so the way I grew up, we're all very affectionate, men, yeah. women, whatever. And I, till this day, I mean, these guys have seen my dad. He'll walk in. Uh, and we kiss each other. I love it, face, man. And it's I just love like, it. And I do that to my son. My son yeah. works for us. He's, a, yeah. he's one of the editors and he's 17. And I'll go up to him and give him a headlock and give him like yeah, yeah, five yeah, or yeah. 10 kisses. And I'll do it on purpose because yeah. I want him to know it's okay oh, yeah. to be affectionate. You brought up social media earlier. I want to go there a little bit because it's like people talk about it quite a bit. It's, it hasn't been around long enough to where we can really mm -hmm. see some of the effects, but I think we're starting to see data now that, because one of the challenges is, okay, depressed, anxious people use social media more. Is it because of depressed and anxious mm -hmm. that they're escaping or is the social media contributing to the depression and anxiety as well? Or is it both? Like, what's the deal? What are your opinions mm -hmm. on social media? Having seen that, come into the fray so much what 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 about its effects on on kids and what do you think's going on with that and what do we need to look out for here's what i know i know they got me like i never had it i never had it and i've got a lot of addiction in my family um like down like down the line and so i i, I know i've got some some natural bent that way but they got me like I agreed taking this job. I'll never tweet anything. I don't even want to be in that world. I, I opened up Facebook and had a seizure. I was like, what is all, what is happening with Facebook? So I said, I'll do one Instagram post a day. Like that'll be a part of my job. That's the agreement I made. And it was about six months in, dude. I'm, I literally was in my closet in my bedroom with the door shut. It was quiet. My kids are running around it. And I was just, and I, I remember smiling going, oh no, yeah. and they got me. Right. And to this day, I have to set some pretty hard boundaries with myself that I, that I don't do a good job of holding up. Um, so I've experienced the addictive nature of this. I don't fully, I hear the dopamine, this and the, the way they withhold it and stuff all fine and good. I've just experienced it. And then when I watch the arc of my students, less and less ability to, like we were talking about earlier, to deal with real world, with problems in the real world it used to blow my students' minds when I would tell them, like when Martin was marching across the bridge, Martin Luther King was, yeah. he understood he's probably going to die. Like this is what that, it's not a thumbs down. That is not a, you are not invested in this thing just right. because you thumbs down or you post like a well-written, like you're not putting your body on the line mm -hmm. here, right? And so we have this disassociated, here's what it means to, and so our feelings get overwhelmed when someone's mean to us. And so I'm going into the Dina student's office or I'm going into my parents. It's a complete dissoci dissociation from the real world. Yeah. Um, I, I have to believe it's not healthy. I think back to my granddad when they used to give him his, they gave him cigarettes when he was a, a child that cause it calmed kids down and they're like, just, <laughs> give, him, just give him a cigarette. It did. It worked great. It worked great. Oh my God. And it stimulated the economy. It did all these things. <laughs> and right. And so I, it sounds so reminiscent of that. 
like, yeah, we know it's killing everybody and they're more likely to have eating disorders and suicide, all that, but it helps the economy and it's helping all these small businesses. And so it sounds like that to me. Um, the other side, I have to I always want to be open-minded. It does allow people to connect all over the place in some unique way that we've never had before. Yeah, right. And so I want to be open to that and not just throw it all out and be like, let's go back to the old days and pass pigeons back and forth. Um, that's not the answer, but I got me. Yeah. You, well, you sound like you're describing it the way I think we do, which yeah. is it's a it's a powerful tool. It's a tool. And a tool can be used to kill somebody and hurt somebody. It's like a chainsaw system. mask, right? Yeah. Yeah, like it can build a home or it can make a well, isn't great Isn't that Texas the story of, uh, of mankind is we That's discover right. fire, fire, yeah. uh, you know, nuclear power and, you know, things that just, they have the potential for so much, yeah. uh, but it could go in either direction. You know what it reminds me of? We grew up, you know, I'm 43, so I grew up in, in an era when heavily processed foods went from not really being a part of our daily diet to in the 80s, it really, if you look at the charts oh. of heavily, like, it went from like, ah, you ate some to you eat breakfast, lunch, dinner all the time. Mm -hmm. And parents at that point really didn't understand the the dangers. It was like, oh yeah, everybody, let's eat it all the time. It's not a big deal. And now we're starting to look back and go, uh oh, <laughs> this is probably why we have this obesity epidemic. But mm -hmm. it's decades later, right. lots of damage. I feel like social media is like that. Yeah. Like you talked about parameters. Yeah. I agree. I think um, like heavily processed foods, there's values. You know, it's got a long shelf life. Right, right. I could ship it across the world and feed people. I could produce calories for very inexpensive, mm -hmm. which has got some value. But you got to put parameters around it because it's also very addictive. It'll kill you. Yeah, <laughs> right. and you can overeat it. You yeah. will overeat it. So I feel like that's what social media is. And we don't have any of that because it's so new. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, it, it, this is, I, I think this is an unpopular opinion. Um, I get grief for it. My kids don't have phones. Yeah. And like, how do you do that I, with your kids, by the way? Cause all the friends, honestly, do. I've just held mm -hmm. the line and my 12 year old is, is, I mean, he's got two parents who are nerds. He's a pretty articulate kid and he's pretty thoughtful. And he came to us once. Uh, he came to me once uh, this year on two different occasions, he came to us twice, but once um, and he was pretty choked up mm -hmm. and, he said, you used to have a phone with that little spirally cord on it where your friends could call you when you were in middle school. Now they text and I'm missing birthday parties. Yeah. I'm missing get togethers. And I'm like, it was like a knife. Mm. He's and a good salesperson. Oh, he's <laughs> great. He, 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 he nailed That's his old man point, to the dude. wall. Yeah, yeah. But he's like, I have no way to communicate with other human beings. And we live out on some acreage out in the woods. And wow. I mean, dude, it was a knife. It That's was like, tough. Because he was right. He was mm -hmm. right. And I still couldn't hand him a loaded weapon and say, make good choices because he's 12, right? And so what it's my job to do is to curate with other parents and say, hey, um, y'all are all welcome at our house. And so I, me and my wife had to say, okay, we've got to get very active about inviting kids over mm -hmm. all the time, providing some things that they would want to do around here. Because the other one was video games. And I was like, dude, no, you can't, just don't go down that rabbit hole. And so when he's like, well, what am I supposed to do, man? And so we had, we got a foosball table and a little cheap air hockey table. I had to give him some other, and that was fair. It was a fair criticism, man. I'm just like, there's a big gym downstairs in the basement. Go work out. And he's like, dad, I'm, I'm 11, man. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> and so, um, and also I had to go be active with him. I had to go take his buddies and we're all going fishing. We're all going to go run around in the woods behind our house. Like mm -hmm. I had to put my crap down instead of reading one more article or one more nerdy book. I had to go be involved with my kids. And so it was challenged me. Um, but What's cool now is to see when kids come over, uh, my wife was just telling me the other day, some, a group of guys came over and they all go run play in the woods. They love being off the games and ours is a house that they can go run play in the woods mm -hmm. and go play in creeks or whatever. Hey, this is how nerdy my kids are. I said, what'd y'all do down there? And here's my son's response. I, was, I told my wife, I was like, oh no, we're creating that kid. He's like, well, we, we, uh, we made an economy. And I was like, oh. what? <laughs> He's like, I was fashioning weapons and this guy was making like herbs and potions for healthcare. I was like, oh no, dude, I yeah. got to get That's you. That's awesome. Really? No, yeah. it's terrible. It's terrible. Oh, oh, so no, dude, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> Shoot each other with bow and arrows or something, yeah. man. Like set them on fire. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but some kids walked in and when they all walked in, they just instantly handed the, their phones to my wife. And they know that when they come over, like their parents have told them, make sure you give this to yeah. oh, wow. uh, her when she comes up. So we just created That's a home great. and now they love coming over. So yeah. it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Plus, and hard. again, just my, my wife's got some some serious wisdom on some of this. She's like, they can be bored. I'm like, I guess. It's the best. Yeah. I guess you're right. It's I used the best. Be, I used to be bored all the time. Yeah, when I was a kid. Out. You look, what kinda... you, look what you've thought through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. You, you said something. Uh, I want to go back to the Martin Luther King because you said something really quick that actually brought up something for me that I thought about. And I think you're a perfect person to talk to this about. But it feels like, uh, and, and I don't know if this is a, because of social media or not, I'd love to hear your opinion, that we have 
so many more people that uh, feel this need to be like an activist in mm -hmm. things. And I know uh, off air, I think we talked, I don't know if we talked about this on air where, you know, Sal's made some points. It's just like, you know, no, you wouldn't. If you were back in Hitler times and you were part of that group and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you act like you would stand up and do something like that, but you probably wouldn't. And statistically speaking, you yeah. wouldn't. 99% yeah, yeah. of us would not be Schindler. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And mean, so, yeah, yeah. but yet I feel like we're in this time now where everybody is this hardcore act. And if you're not, then yeah. you get shamed for not being that way. Is this a thing of social media? Is this uh, something new that's happening? Like, what do you see when you're, when you're working with people? It's, it's a, uh, I don't call it virtue signaling. It's just, but there's just now this platform to scan everybody almost instantaneously and, and make sure we're all on the same team. And it used to be, I just had to assume we were all on the same team because we were on the same team. Just right? tribalism. Uh, yeah. um, and now I can just scan through and say, do you believe all the same things I believe? If mm. not, I can just easily cut you out. Oh, I've got this I group see. now. And so it's a natural, I think it's a natural tribal instinct that is just gone horribly awry. Mm -hmm. I learned, like talking about my wife and the miscarriage stuff, I learned sitting with hugging a dad whose wife had just passed away. He may be 85 and she's 90, right? Mm -hmm. And she lived a long, great life. It wasn't a tragedy. She just passed away. No words, no words is the best thing, mm. right? Um, true story, when, when my wife finally, when she went to the hospital, among crisis responders, you, it can be a crazy situation. There's blood and brains. There's, but you look across the room at another crisis responder, and I call it crazy eyes or wild eyes. They'll look at you and everything's chaotic and loud, but you can see this situation's under control, mm. right? The, this, the threat is over. Now we're in figuring out what comes next mode. And I walked, um, my wife had just called and she was weeping. She's like, I'm on the way to the hospital. I'm like, whoa. So I picked up my son and we went over there. I didn't think it was that big of a, I didn't know what it was, but I didn't, I thought she was pregnant. She's going to the hospital. I saw the director of the OBGYN and my wife's in a wheelchair and I saw her eyes and I'll never forget. I grabbed my son's hand because my first thought was this last time I'm going to see her. Like I saw it. Right. Um, and there was this, this, why was I telling you that? I just lost it. We were talking, I was telling you about the activism that everybody seems. Oh to yeah, yeah. yeah. So we go into the hospital room. So my, somebody comes, picks up my son, a buddy of mine. Who's a rancher, big, tall, skinny, West Texas rancher comes with a cowboy hat on and he sits right here. And he said, no words, none. And I just sat there and I was good to see him. I was like, man, good to see you. He's nodded. He sat there with me, sat there with me, sat there with me. Doctor comes, says we lost to keep the baby. Um, your wife's going to be all right. And I just kind of, and I had my foot crossed like this and I just like, and he reached over and grabbed my foot and then he started crying. And I remember thinking passing, he cried tears I didn't even have yet. And it was, he showed up and he said no words. He could have lectured me on what was happening in the surgery room, on the, on the percentages, chances of her being okay. He said nothing. Cause that when somebody's hurting, when somebody's, when there's a, crazy situation going shut your mouth just be with right so it goes back to you know what wisdom is doesn't comment on everything mm. wisdom comments on very very few things the few hills you're going to die on then i'm, then I'm gonna speak on it mm. uh, otherwise i'd rather just be with you yeah, does that a, make sense there's a lot of yeah, old yeah. wise quotes that have say something like just shut up yeah fools you know speak a lot yeah or something along those lines so i think i think wisdom is say something about everything that's 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 foolish, man. Mm, yeah. Foolish. Speaking of words and not words, so I, you know, not using words to express how you feel. Um, so I have, uh, I have three kids. I got one on the way, so I'm gonna have four soon. I got two. Yeah. Thank you very much. I got one that's 17, one that's about to turn 13. And there's a big gap. Yeah. And I got a, a baby, and then I'm gonna have a new one. And I noticed with the teenagers, it gets harder and harder to read or to kind of understand what's going on. And it's mm -hmm. natural. They're growing mm -hmm. up, and they less and less they need to communicate with mom and dad and. Mm -hmm. Are there are there signs and things for parents to pick up on when it's time to press and when it's okay to not press? Like for example, if your kid is like you know hanging out in the room a lot, mm -hmm. which you know it's kind of a natural thing I think for yeah. teenagers want to do, or changes in moods. Like are there are there red flags, if you will, that aren't so obvious? Where okay, now maybe is a time to sit down and kind of push because you know you ask a teenager, hey, what's wrong? Well, I'm fine. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. like, are there things to look out for? Yeah, I think there's, yeah, that's a great question. I think there's two answers to that. One is you can't wait until there's a thing to try to develop a relationship with a kid. Okay, good point. And so there's something about, uh, we were talking about off air, my son's 12, and so I'm entering in. I've never seen this done, so I'm kind of winging this, but we're going to have some weekly 
like I finished the comfort crisis. Michael Easter's new book is fantastic. Okay. I uh, blocked out all the F words and uh, cause he's still squat. And I said, this is your next book. You got to read. And he's like, dude, I don't read any dumb science books. He buzzed through it. Cause there's like a hunting over And so then we went out to breakfast at some awful, I don't know, waffle house or something just, and, but we ate stupid and we talked about the book. What'd you get out of it? And what did you think? He's like, man, I'm glad I don't have video games. And I was like, Michael Easter come through, right? right? <laughs> like, um, but like, it was this, I'm going to set up a context so that when, when it comes, whatever comes in his life, when he's feeling down, when he's feeling depressed, when he's in over his head, he's gotten a fight, what, that I'm a safe place for him to come to not in that crazy moment. That's why we talk about sex all the time in my house. There's not going to be a, Got it. a big talk, you know, like when I awkwardly drive and I look straight ahead and tell my kids <laughs> about sex, like they're just know about it all the time so that when they have real questions, it's not a weird it's thing open. for them to come. Right. So that's number one is building a context. The second thing is, yes, parents are really good at stuff in their like duct taping over their gut feeling. They know. And it's often like my son's like, you, you know, your teenage son's going to his room, won't come out, won't come out, come out. You know, like, Something doesn't feel, but I just need to back off, right? I just need to back off. I don't want to be that guy. But And I would tell parents, go be that guy. Okay. Like, go get involved in your kid. That is never going to be the moment. It's, hey, we're going to get dinner tonight, just you and me. We're going to hang out. I may do that a second night and be like, dude, you've been in your room a lot. What's going on? And I'm going to build a relational context so that we can get in, have that conversation. So really, it's just trust your gut. Trust your gut, man. Little little things like if you see your kid never come out of the room, um, you can say things like, hey, we eat dinner at this table. So if you're going to eat, you need here. You can choose to not eat, but we serve food here, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to set some boundaries in my home. Um, that The whole phrase, like, you know, kids are just being kid. I don't fully buy all that. Like kids, teenagers, they're like, they stay up later naturally because of their sure. sleep. That, that stuff's real. Um, but when it comes to like, well, you know, teenagers, they just talk trash to their parents. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If you allow that in your home or you say, well, that's just teenagers, then that's, that's a whole other thing. I'm going to create boundaries in my home where my kids feel safe and- then we're going to give them the appropriate distance as they grow up and form their own identity, of course. Well, you said something I think is important. It sounds like you you said, too, that you would you would take him out the first night and probably give him that space to come to you first. And then you take him out another night. And then the following night, you'd be more a little prodding yes. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So still giving him the, that boundary of like, let's see if I just being here, being dad and having a good time, see if he opens up and shares with me. I, going back to the original, like, I don't want his cortisol and adrenaline running. When we're talking, because we're right. gonna not gonna have a conversation, because sure. his body's trying to defend. Right, then himself he'll from connect me. every time he dad takes me out. Oh, this must be a talk. He's Dad's just defend, taking me he's out. gonna be defending himself right. from me. Mm. I want him to come in and go through the defense process, and then be like, Oh, there's nothing. Oh, it's just oh, great, just right. great yeah. dinner with dad. Awesome. Yeah, 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 it's awesome. And then we're gonna show up the next time, and then I'm gonna get you know because I I my kid always on me about how healthy I eat. I'm going to get the Big Mac or with some stupid meal. And he's going to be like, oh, now we've completely changed the dynamic of this yeah, interaction. And be like, dude, you've been in your room a lot. What's going on? And now we're going to have a different conversation. Yeah. I had a weird, I had an, this is just personal, but I had a, uh, you know, interesting period. So my, with my older kids, I'm divorced from their mom. Right. Okay. So, uh, we, we haven't been married now for about seven years. And that was a tough transition because I went, it was, I wanted them to be happy all the time when they were with me. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I want to protect them from right. the challenges of divorce. And so getting them to do things they don't want to do is like, okay. We don't have to do it. Okay. We don't have to do it. And I remember at one point I said, you know, this, this can't be like, this is obviously me. This is my problem. <laughs> and so I forced them to do certain things. Now we're going to eat dinner now. Mm -hmm. Now we're not going to put on electronics and they would him and ha and be a pain in the ass for about 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then they'd start to open up. Mm -hmm. And then I had this realization like, okay, like <laughs> I got to be the parent <laughs> and not their friend. Right, right. What about other challenges with like divorced, but involved parents or blended families? Like what are some of the challenges yeah. you see with that or things that pay, or is it just the same thing? You just got to work a little harder because. No, I think when it comes to divorce, I think we, um, I think it's so common that we minimize. That's a big trauma for a kid, yeah. right? That's a big, um, it's a big challenge when mom and dad hurt or when mom and dad are anxious or mom and dad are spun up. A kid's natural inclination is to say, I caused this. What did I do? And how do I fix this? And so I think an important conversation to have with your kids long term over and over is, this is my issue. This, this is not, you yeah. didn't participate in this. This isn't because of something you did or didn't do, right? And kids have that fantasy that mom and dad are getting back together. So there's, they live with this stuff in their bodies, right? When's the next person going to leave? When's my norm going to get blown up? And so I think it's comp always pulling them back to, um, no, we're okay now. And like you and me are good. 
Right. Yeah, you, what you said. I read a I read a um, an article um, on kind of what you said, where when something traumatic or bad happens to a child, like a parent is just a shitty parent, mm-hmm. that the part of the survival mechanism for the kid is they, their choices are either my caretaker is evil and terrible, in which case I'm screwed because yeah. I have no one else, yeah. or I have to internalize it and make it my fault, or I did something so that I can continue to be worse. With this caretaker. It's worse. It's worse than that. That kid knows half of him is me. Wow. And so if I demonize dad who beat up mom and then cheated on her and then took off, half of me is bad. Mm. And so I have to be okay with it. I got to make peace with dad. In fact, I got to make dad the hero of this story. Mom, why'd you kick out, right? And so I've got to make peace with this thing. It's not so much as I'm going to be on my own. It's that part of me is dysfunctional. So you got a kid trying to toggle back and forth between these two parents and that's, it becomes a mess, right? Or I got to solve it. Yeah. And then you got kids trying to take care of their parents. Don't say this, man, because dad flies off the handle or mom gets really pissed if you say this, so let's all be cool. You got kids emotionally regulating their parents, man. That That's a burden no child can Yeah, it, I understood p- part of that when, which where I- That's my story. I never mm-hmm. said anything negative about, ever, mm-hmm. about my kid's mom to that's them. That's beautiful. Because I knew, I, I, I in, you know, intuitively I said, this is, they're going to internalize that. It's their mom. And it's also none of their business. It's not their yeah, yeah, issue. Yeah. This is mine. So yeah. I, I made sure to never do that. And I think that's, that was a very good decision among other bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Another <laughs> gift you can give your kids, like if you're going through a divorce, it- let them know that you're sad. And parents, we're, we're taught to like protect our kids, right? We don't yeah. want them to. And when they get sad about stuff and we look like we're all got it all together, going to the gym, going to get it done. They think they're crazy. Oh, I see. Like I'm weak. Oh, I'm dysfunctional. I need to figure out how to get over this so I can be like him or I can be like her. The greatest gift you can give your kid is, so we talk about, how do I talk about stuff with my kid, with my kids? Yeah. I'll tell my son, like dad's, dad's friend died. I'm real sad today. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to go fishing today. Um, I just want to sit on the couch and watch, read a book and it's not good for me. We'll go for a walk later, but um, I'm real sad right now. And I tell my kids I'm sad. Uh, whenever the uh, whenever the Ukraine thing set off, um, I brought my son up and said, this is a grown up conversation I'm having with you. Um, tell me what you know about Russia and Ukraine. He knew A, way more than I thought he did from just middle schoolers talking mm-hmm. and B, some of it was all skewed, right? Like I guess mm-hmm. nuclear, he just assumed we we're going to be dead soon. Like nuclear wars happening, whatever. And I told him, I'm scared about this. There's a history arc here that I don't like. It's, you know, I, I walk through, here's how your dad's feeling. And then it was, here's what I'm going to do about it. So I'll click the phone off. Me and you are going to go hang out. We're going to go for a walk. So I'm going to go be around people. So I'm teaching him. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to check the news. And then you got to put that stupid thing down. And now we got to go about doing life, right? Mm. So I want him to see his old man feeling these things and then going to do anyway. Oh, that's great. All right. All right let, let's, let's give people some, I guess, some takeaways who are listening right now who, you know, I, I mean, just listening to you, like, like Adam said earlier, you're such a good communicator. I'm sure some uh, people are like, man, I got some stuff I want to work through or whatever. Or maybe I, maybe I need to become more aware of some of my behaviors. Mm. What are some, some easy, and I know it's not an easy process, so mm. I don't want to simplify, you know, make it sound like it's a simple thing, but what are some steps that people can take when they're like, okay, I need to work on myself, or this is an issue that I have that I've just kind of been put in the background. What are some steps people can take to kind of work, get through some of that? I've changed my tune on this the last few years. Okay. I normally would have started with goals and habits and those kind of things. Okay, I don't anymore. Because I think if I look at the arc of all the science and all of my personal experience and just wisdom, there is no long-term behavior change done in isolation. So if somebody is ready to make some changes in their life, I think you got to get some people in your corner. Mm. So whether that's a friend, whether that's a therapist, whether that's a personal trainer, whether that's a coach, whether that's um, calling some buddies that you haven't been with in a while. But I think you have to establish relationship with people. So you're anchored into a thing so that you can repel off and do that hard work. Now, how important though, is it how you choose that relationship, Uh, right? Because you know, everybody has that, that friend that is, you know, you come to that and you're, and you're venting or you're sharing what's going on with you. And instead of them probably helping you get to the root cause or the bottom they're they're probably making it worse pile on it. Like, let's say I come and I'm, you know, venting about my wife or something mm-hmm. and oh, fuck her. I yeah, can't yeah, believe, you know, you, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. good probably that's person. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, how does some feel numb about yeah, it? How did, yeah, how, yeah. How, how does, how does someone have the awareness to know like, okay, yeah, who, who are these people? Who yeah. should you, what should you look yeah, for? Who someone? should I be trying to foster these relationships? That's because those I would think would be unhealthy in a situation. So my, my, <laughs> my answer to that's going to be a screwy one. Um, I think you have to put that question on the back burner and go. 
Because mm-hmm. I think that's the question that we look around. And I think if you, we have one epidemic, it's loneliness. It's people are just dying. Oh, wow. So at oh, this okay. point, you're saying like it, go, human connection and, and you're that, gonna go, is, that is better than nothing. You're going to be in a room like this and you're going to be like, that dude just will not shut up about Sasquatches, man. Like, <laughs> I, that's the, not a guy I'm going to call when my wife's struggling. The hell is yeah. his deal? But I, I know, man. We did land yeah. on the moon. But um, <laughs> also, um, but I really connected with you. And I'm a holotist, you know what I mean? Mm. And so it, it naturally happens that way, Got right? It. And we're just not good with, we just, we avoid relationships so much or we outsource it all to digital stuff, right? And talking about social media earlier, I can text my wife all day long. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah. I love you. I'm giving her info, but part of her brain, the brain that feels safe because she's in a relationship with me does not register until she sees me. Right. And so I don't say I love you. I've said it 40 times via text today. I sent you some fun emojis, right? You know, I'm in. Her body isn't registering that, right? So yeah. I'm going to get with people and just we say, a, I'm struggling with this. We have a rule in our relationship with I love you. Like I don't, I don't say it very often. And when I do say it, uh, when I see her, I have to explain what I was thinking about. So I can't, it, we don't do the, Oh, I love you and hang up uh-huh. the phone. It just, I, I think it has no weight, no uh-huh. value at all like that. It's if I text even mm-hmm. and say, I love you, then there's something that was going on in my mind that made me do that. And I have to be able to express that when I Will see Will you do you. a 30 day challenge for me? What's that? Make some sort of physical skin to skin contact with her when you do it next time. Yeah. 30 yep. days. So that's what happens. Like touch. So that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. He right? does that so, with us all the time. So, I know he does. No, so I after, know. after text, ears. Ears. <laughs> I've got to be, I'm not making I, that up. That's I've got to be in person <laughs> yeah. and yeah. she's, and she'll normally, she'll come over and grab me and be like, what were you thinking about today? And then we'll okay, so it happens. That. That, that's oh awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how it goes down. So, okay. So you're going to connect with people. Yes. Okay. I'm going to, um, is the, the great David Kessler, the grief, the grief expert says grief demands a witness. I got to sit down and tell somebody, I'm hurting like this, or I okay. don't like what I see in the mirror, or I drink too much, or I'm addicted to pornography, whatever's going on in your life. Right. I'm going to say it out loud, and then I'm going to be about changing my thoughts and changing my actions, and I'm going to get after it, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got to change my behavior, and then I got to change what I'm thinking here. And I think psychology, modern psychology, has not done a great job. We've convinced people that if you get your thoughts in the right order, then you're well. Yeah. And I don't think that's right. I think you got to go do. Mm-hmm. I think you got to do. You got to act differently. And those yeah. thoughts become solidified in who you are. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, there's uh, this there's a this study that now is making its rounds um, that's questioning the serotonin model of depression, the, the chemical imbalance. You know, yeah. um, like depression, and anxiety. It's all about a chemical imbalance. And yeah. if we just balance out your chemicals with medications, then we'll solve the problem. Um, what do you think about about all of that? Because it really changed the trajectory of of mental health. It was like all therapy. And then it turned into like lots of uh, prescriptions, the, the the Prozac revolution and all that stuff. Like, what are your thoughts about? I like I'm being honest here, and y'all yeah. feel free to edit this out if this doesn't make it here. <laughs> I don't know. We don't edit um, shit, bro. Go for it. <laughs> Wrong like real. when you saw penicillin come on the scene, you saw infections fall off, right? And what we've seen as we've added more and more and more psychotropic medications. Yeah, good point is the data has gone the other way. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't know why, cool, get into the the molecular structures. There's an importance there, right? Yeah. And I'll leave that to the Huberman minds. Those minds are way, way faster than mine. You can just look at the charts and graphs, man. Like it's, it's clearly not a if-then proposition here when it comes yeah. to medication. Does medication help? Yes. Here's the way I like to think of it. Like say, take something like anxiety. I'm gonna take major depression. That's a whole other world. Take something like anxiety off. If I look at anxiety as an identity, like I'm broken, I've got a thing. Like I have a thing that's always going to be a part of me and that I'm going to have to be versus no, it's just an alarm system. It's just my body getting my attention, letting me know that, Hey, I'm not safe. I'm disconnected. I don't have autonomy. Then medications like climbing up in my living room when I've got a, like a fire at my house and the smoke detector's going off and taking the batteries out. I didn't fix the fire. It turns the alarm off, man. And we've made the alarm the issue. It's not the problem. What a great analogy. And so I want to step back and go, look, if my relationships are solid, I'm not safe. I don't owe a bunch of people a bunch of money. Um, I've got good relationships. My job is stable. My home is stable. Your anxiety alarms aren't going to go off. Or when they do, you know there's a problem, Mm -hmm. right? I can actually hear them. They're not just going off all the time. But... We've all been in that hotel room where the, uh, you know, you got the hot water on and it sets off the smoke detector. Yeah. You're like, dude, there's something wrong with the detector. That was me, right? I, I burned through it for years so hard that 
anxiety meds helped me turn the alarm down so that I could hear a therapist so that I could go oh, I start exercising and be with people because I couldn't hear anything. Man, I was crazy. I couldn't hear a thing. And so it's got value, but it's not the solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. no, that makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about therapy because uh, I, you know, I, 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 we're in this interesting generation here where we there was a shift from, I mean, I, like when I was younger, therapy was a bit... Like you didn't talk about it. It wasn't nah, something you go tell people. Like I'm seeing somebody. It was no. almost like uh, you it's know, like having somebody on the side, dude. It was yeah, like yeah. Yeah. you went to it on Tuesday nights at seven. And you told nobody. Yeah, especially yeah, yeah. if you were a guy. Yes. Especially if you were a man, you mm. you just it's, you didn't do that because it's like oh I got this big problem I can't fix that big yeah. deal. Now it seems to be much more expect you know um, accepted. Mm. Um, what do you think about therapy and its value um, for people? And is it something you should go get just when you have a problem? Or do you think therapy is good to have anyway? No, I had a professor that said the problem with therapy is that most people wait until they oh. are, they're out of it, until they're trying to survive. And you can't hear or learn when you're trying to survive. She likened it to waiting until you wake up with the flu to start a new weight loss program at the gym. Right. It's like, that's the worst time to go work out, right? Because mm -hmm. you're sick. You don't feel good. Um, it does help in critical care. So if you're struggling, if you're thinking about hurting yourself, of course, go see a therapy. Your marriage is on the rocks. Of course, go see somebody. I look at counseling as just a set of skills, man. It's mm -hmm. tools I don't have. It's 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 me practicing how to be in a relationship with somebody. And then pra me practicing hearing somebody tell me the truth. And when my body gets pissed, a good counselor will say, I just told you that it sounds like you're the one as the person who cheated on your spouse, you're the one who brought this and you look mad. Tell me about that, right? So you're learning the things we talked about at the very beginning. Yeah. I'm learning how to be in a relationship with somebody. So then, then I can go apply that at work. I can apply that with my kids. I can apply that with my wife. And it's just, I, I, it's just a, set of till, a set of skills or tools. We wouldn't think twice about going to get handgun training or go to MMA training. I wouldn't think twice about hiring any of y'all to help me get in shape. Why would I think twice about helping somebody teach me some relational skills that I clearly don't have because me and my wife fight all the time or my kids don't like me like that. It, it's a, it's a simple tools and relationship proposition. Yeah. So I guess the question, if, if it was positioned, like uh, when's the best time to hire a, a trainer? Be like, well, right out the gates yeah. before, yeah. before you're before, obese, before you're hundred yeah. pounds overweight. So, and you're going to have different thing. If I'm, I'm going to hire a trainer, if I've got goals, to, cause I want to go be a professional lifter. If I've got a competition coming up right. and I used to always tell folks, Michael Jordan had, he had a nutritionist. He had a weightlifting guy. He had a basketball coach. All the greats have coaches, man. So go get some help, right? Go learn some new skills. Do you think, so what does that look like for, you know, people getting married, new couple, and they're happy. Obviously they're yeah, in love. Yeah. Like what? Once a, once a week, twice a month. What is that? What is, what I do think, you think it's different for everybody. Okay. Uh, again, it goes back to like the, the personality thing. I think if you're struggling with bipolar disorder and you're regulating your meds and you're having, or borderline personality. So that's a, that's a tough one, right? Mm -hmm. Cause you're having to, your body feels these things and I have to learn how to operate in the real world. Sometimes in opposition to my feelings, it's yeah. gonna, you need a couple times a week, man. It's hard. That's hard work you gotta do. Um, if I'm trying to learn a new person, I'm going to get married to, man, we can do once a week, once every two weeks. And we're going to do homework. When we get home, we're going to read books together. We're going to learn. We're going to do a budget together. We're going to, you know, all those things like, uh, um, and so it just depends on the couple and the person. I wouldn't let the trying to figure that out on the front and sh how many times should I go to the gym? Five times, right. three times, just go, go. And, and then, then we'll figure that as there. we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. We overthink it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about you for a second. The difference, because I, I we all experience this as, as trainers. We mm -hmm. all train people and manage gyms for decades. Mm -hmm. And then we start this podcast and similar, we're helping people, but different because I don't know who I'm, I don't see who I'm helping. Yeah. And I remember we did these these live events before mm -hmm. the pandemic. We would go and meet with these live, and they weren't profitable. They made us no money. We just did it just to connect with people. And I remember all of us left the first one going, that's what was missing. Yeah. We all feel grounded again. Like we mm -hmm. got to see people's faces and get their reactions. Did you go through something similar from working with people to now you're on media and kind of just. So when I was trying to deconstruct this influencer thing, like yeah. I trying to figure out like, what is, what world have I just entered? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 I thought very early on, like first month, the moment I go from talking with people to talking with people who talk to people, I'm going to be out of touch. Mm. I'm going to be missing why I got in this in the first place. And so, yeah, for me, live events, staying connected. And then honestly, it's volunteering my local community. Like I got to go be involved behind closed doors with people. I cannot lose that. Um, if I lose that, what it actually feels like to be in a room with somebody who's hurting, I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be effectual when I'm talking to somebody. So what, is, what has been your favorite part of this transition in your career? And what has been your least favorite part of this transition? Um, the best part has been, 
I, I listen to like three podcasts. Like I'm just not in that world. And I didn't realize, here's a good example. <laughs> we were in a meeting about six months in and there's a big flat screen up there and they were going through data and then they pulled something up and it had my face and all these little thumbnails. I was like, what is that? <laughs> They're like, that's your YouTube channel. And I was like, what? <laughs> like YouTube channel, A, I didn't know what a YouTube, I'd never heard of a YouTube channel. Oh I thought a YouTube ch was like where you watched old Rage Against the Machine videos <laughs> and where you yeah, like needed to fix your car. Like I didn't know there was ch had channels. All, I didn't know anything about that. And I had one, right? And it was doing great. I just, <laughs> I knew they had cameras. That I didn't know what that was, right? And so um, I, I have to always remember that end person, right? So the, the best part of this has been somebody in Alaska calling and saying, I sat down and had a hard conversation with my wife last night and told her how I'm actually feeling for the first time. And she wept. And now we're going to start having a hard conversation once like that. Like how you just said, we're going to start doing this weird thing that only our marriage does, but it's going to work for us. Yeah. That the reach has been something that caught me off guard. I just That's thought my cool. mom was buying books and she was like clicking over and over. Like, <laughs> we got a hundred new views. It's like, my mom's after it, man. She, and it's not. I mean, people are tuning in. Um, the hardest part is, man, y'all probably appreciate this more than anybody. In coming from higher education, coming from just my whole career was working with scientists, just nerds, right? And they were, the goal of science was to be less wrong. And so, like, take COVID, for instance. I think, I don't remember, I think it's King's College. Some college puts down right when COVID kicks off. We think 15 million people are going to die. Mm. This news channel reported it this way. This politician said it this way. For science people across the world, they went, game on. Sweet. And they took their models and their brains, and they, within two weeks, we think it's going to be 12. 12 million. And then more data is coming in. And then a few months, we think it's going to be 8 million. And so science was all about being less wrong. And I've come to believe there's only two mediums that don't have a reset button. And that's politics and media. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I don't Agreed. like about it is if I learned some new thing next week that said, no, dude, there's a new medication that will literally control all delete your anxiety, your, your, you know, your, uh, your parts of your brain that kick off anxiety. We fix it. We solve it. I would have to come back and say, dude, I learned something new. This is fantastic. And then I get the media mob like, ooh, flip flopper, change your mind. Yeah. I know what he's talking about. And so there's a steady arc that I'm used to that I feel like I feel myself saying more and more, I got to put a stick in the ground and this is just going to have to be that stick forever. And so I'm trying to model what that looks like to say, no, man, like a... I learned more about my wife. We we just celebrated 20 years of marriage last week. Congratulations. I've learned more about her in the last two years than I did. You know what I mean? That's the that's that's the goal, but it's hard to feel like I, you got to say the thing forever. And that's yeah. new to me. Yeah. What do you mm -hmm. think about um, all this crazy research? There's a lot of old research, but more recently we've had some incredible research on um, psychedelic, uh, mm. you know, ass assisted talk therapy, you know, MDMA yeah. and uh, psilocybin, psilocybin and yeah. ketamine. Yeah. What do you think MDMA, about that? I mean, A, you can't argue, argue with the data right now. It looks extraordinary. Um, and anything that people are circling back on that's been a part of cultures for thousands of years, nature's just got a great way of working itself out, right? Mm. And so I always want to look at that. Um, I'm interested in the mechanism by which it does it, right? Like what, what is, that's one that actually the, me, the mechanics of it matter to me. Mm -hmm. Can I get that way with deep empathetic relationships? Could I, as a parent, teach my kids how to be that in touch with themselves? Or man, is this just a great, same as with like uh, penicillin. No, oh, man, you get a cut. It's going to change civilization forever. It's one of those moments. That'd be awesome. Have but, you experimented with it yet? No, I haven't. It's but, interesting. I have, and I have in, in, I'm, I'm 40, going to be 41 years old. And right? you've got, you got a pretty traumatic background. Right. And, and I used it for our, our relationship. So both my wife and I, neither, neither one of us had ever experimented with whatever. It was the, this, the research and stuff that was coming mm -hmm. out that made me curious. Yeah. Um, both of us don't have a, this background of drugs or addictions sure. with that. So it was definitely new territory. We went to a, like a very safe split place where we're on the beach. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've now experienced it three times with her. Uh, every time there has been a breakthrough in the relationship. Mm. It's been fascinating. And I think we are, we communicate really, really mm. well and uh, very open to talk, but there has been moments in that. And I, and the best way I can explain it um, and put words to it is it almost like it, it, it 
opens up a new pathway in the brain. Like say there's a way that she has thought or I have thought about the relationship that, oh, she does things this way for that. I'm in her brain trying mm -hmm. to figure that out. And there is actually nothing she can say or do that will convince me otherwise because I have decided that path. Yeah. And so it's like solidified. And then you get in that in that space and it almost like breaks that down. And then all of a sudden you see her different. Mm -hmm. And when she explains it, all of a sudden that it makes the new pathway. And you're like, oh my God. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get why you do that. Now it makes total sense to me. It's been, it's it makes been, me, it makes me also wonder, and I know there's data on this as well, that it could go either direction. Well, it's a tool. Yeah. I feel like it's, mm. it's another, it's another tool that we obviously, it's been around for a very, very long time mm -hmm. and it's been used in cultures. And mm -hmm. I think that it, it, it can be abused like anything else. We see that we talked, we talked early on in the podcast space. Um, one of the things we became really fascinated is as we started to grow, and we started networking with other fitness minds. There's actually a, a big movement in the fitness space around psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And we got to hang out with a lot of these people. And you could definitely see the abuse side. You can see someone take a little bit of science and the mm -hmm. positive benefits of it to justify their weekly behaviors right, right. around it. And I just think that... Um, I don't think that's how you, I personally don't think that's a, a smart way to do it. I'd I also think. be afraid from what I've read that the, um, because it can open you up if mm -hmm. you don't have a trained therapist or counselor in front of you. It could be dangerous. Yeah. Oh, I could imagine that yeah, it could, yeah. you could probably create more trauma. Well, yeah. Matt, Plus, think about the history of psychosis in, in your family. You know, you need to really make sure you go through all that yeah. process. Yeah, no, I definitely think, I mean, think of like, we talk on the show about my experience with bodybuilding, you know, experiencing it at 30 years old. If I experienced that at 20 years oh, old, yeah. it would have fucked me up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I oh, would me too. If this had happened when I was 28, dude, I'd be a wreck. Man. Yeah. I'm a wreck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't ready. I wasn't yeah. mentally ready for it. I wasn't self-aware enough to take myself through a process mm -hmm. like that. Probably the same thing with those psychedelics. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 40 years old experimenting with it at, th I think, 38 when I did mm -hmm. it or whatever. Like, you guys already have a good relationship. Yeah, already had it. Yeah. We already have a 10-year relationship. We got solid. It, and it wasn't even like a deal breaker type of thing that we broke through. It was literally just a small thing yeah. that we just didn't see eye to eye ever. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, agree to disagree. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, think yeah. this way? I think that way about it and we still love each other goodbye yeah. but then all of a sudden for the first time it was like she saw me yeah. and I was like whoa that was so crazy and it's happened three times all three times we've had some sort of crazy breakthrough like that so my, my question that I, I, I love the work they're doing over with the maps and that crew yeah. is it was real important when I realized I was making up stories about other people and then getting pissed at them about the story I'd created mm -hmm. right um, it was just like an awareness like when that dude cuts you off in, in the in the highway. Yeah. You'll probably heard that like that drug using idiot is trying to kill everybody on the highway. He's got no regard for life or, or wife is in the hospital and the kid is yeah. dying. And I get to her, pick yeah. the story. Yeah. And, um, the same thing with my wife, right? Yep. You left those shoes. there just, to, if I, if I can stop <laughs> right then yeah. and go, do we just talked about this last night? If those shoes are there, her day must've sucked. Mm. I'm going to grab those. I'm going to go knock the dishes out too. Like my, my, my curiosity is, can I get there? I believe you can without, without it. that, without it. I um, believe you can. Or is this a safe alternative just to dude, save me eight years of <laughs> almost so, blowing my marriage up to get there quicker? So that, so that yeah. I think yes and yes. Yeah. I think you're right both ways. I think that it's, I think it is a bit of a hack like an intervention yeah, yeah. Or, or a way to kind of disrupt that pattern. Maybe that mm -hmm. maybe it's something that's, that was keeping us is childhood buried stuff that I'm not even oh, socially aware or self-aware about mm -hmm. myself. Her too. It was a small block and it was just enough to break well, that yeah, and go, aha. Uh -huh. awesome. Yeah. The, what I, what I read about the data is that it's like, uh, it helps people face certain things. So they that's can right. talk about it. Yeah. Cause otherwise they couldn't even talk about it. I can't even bring this up. I can't even, cause my body is so protected. Well, me. and what we've, I, what mm -hmm. we found was, I, when we went in, it wasn't like, hey, we're going in this. We need to work on a relationship. We were already in a good place. Yeah. It was just- Which we is, at, the, I think is probably the best time to do yeah. that. Yeah, we right? were just enjoying each other and yeah. having conversation. And then the conversation led to an area where yeah. we didn't like always see eye to eye. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, I see yeah. you. It was so you wild know, that- Speaking of relationships, because I, I, this is really cool topic. So I, when I would train people in advanced age, like I said earlier, I had a lot of clients at one point. Um, I used to love asking them relationship questions because they were married for- 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50 years. I thought there was so much wisdom there. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you've picked up working with people, with people who've been together for a long time versus people who haven't been? Like what helps lead to some of the success and why do some people not? I think able it to all comes it? down to ego, man. Mm. Like say you're sorry, go do the dishes for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I, I wish it was more sophisticated than that. 
like be a person of integrity and say you're sorry. Well, that's simple, but it isn't that easy, is it? No, it's like, yeah, yeah how do you lose weight? Diet and exercise, man. It's not hard, right? It's yeah, like, right. Yeah, yeah, but it goes really back to complex. what you originally said, your practice. I think that's also something I picked up on your communication yeah. skills is you it's immediately, oh, yeah, you, you've practiced. Someone says something, you humble yourself always, you're careful, and you just you practice, then become second nature. Or you fly off the handle. Yeah. <laughs> you storm out of the house. And then you catch and you it. come back. Yeah. And you come back and say, I just acted like a child and I'm sorry. Yeah. If parents would, would apologize to their kids, dude, and model what that looks like, mm -hmm. I mean, you can change generation in, in 15 years, right? Mm. If a group of people would just act different. I can talk to my son about how to treat a, a women all day long. He's watching how well I tip that waitress. And he's watching how I talk to the, the yeah. woman at the register. He watches how I talk to his sister and to, mom, to his mom. That's easy. It's just like that, man. But I think it comes down to ego. I like just putting it down, man. And the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. Are, there, are there certain things when you are talking to somebody and you're kind of like evaluating their relationship or their struggle they're going through and you kind of like know like this is, for example, John Gottman, right? Uh, yeah. I believe talks about uh, having contempt uh, for the partner, right? It's like, like he knows, That's right? one of the worst ones. Like Resil 90, resentment. That's, uh, it, and we're probably, it's probably semantics, but resentment. Once you get to the place that I despise being in connection with you, like you are the reason my life is fill in the blank. I, that's real hard to come back from. Yeah. What do you, what, it's an ash. And, Cause you're on the phone, right? So yeah, yeah. are there certain, is there certain language that they're saying for you to pick mm. up on that? And since that, like, Oh, this person is, and you almost kind of know, like, it's almost intuitive. Yeah. 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 It's, like, it's, I've seen you already do it. I've seen you kind of like, uh, like see this yeah, is. why don't you leave? More questions. <laughs> why don't yeah. you get out? <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's usually this, when you start cycling into blame, when you have outsourced, your feelings to somebody else mm. outside of a, like a clearly abusive context. Right. But I'm always angry because he just comes home and gets on the couch. No, you're angry because you're immature. Mm. You're angry because you want to have a hard conversation. You're angry at yourself because you've, you have thought so little of your own needs that you have. Right. So anger is something you're deciding within you. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think when it gets, I don't know, there's a tone. There's a particular way somebody talks about somebody else. It's like, Oh, that's mm. disdain. Mm. Like you, don't want that person in your life, right? Here's the other magic about like any good counsel worth of salt or the show is I'm not tied into an answer. So a lot mm -hmm. of like advice shows are about, I need to show you I'm right. Yeah. Like if I ask a question like, oh, you hate that dude. And she says, no, I don't hate him. I love him. I want to stay with him. But th that's just data for me. That's not me being wrong, right? And so I'm able to lob questions and you get you get good at it over time right but um you know when somebody yeah. comes in is like dude i've been eating 1500 calories and working out five times a week and i can't lose it you yeah. can go no you're, no, you're not <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> i was talking to lane uh to, to, to norton the other day and yeah. i was like i've been doing this and this and he just goes what you've just said is physiologically impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know what you're doing. You're not doing that. Yeah. Was, we science. actually had a caller do that. I was like, oh, no. We had a woman call in and said uh, yeah. uh, that they need, she needs to lose uh, like, it was like 50 pounds. Oh, yeah. I know what you're and, talking about. Uh, but, we, you know, eating healthy is, is so expensive. So, like, how do I do this? And all of us are sitting there listening, and I don't want to make the person feel yeah. bad. And I, if you're listening now, I, I apologize. It's just we've done this for so long, and I – just said to her, well, you can also just eat what you're eating now and eat less of it. So you'll save money yeah. and yeah. lose weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like that. Yeah. It's just one of those, you know, one of those things. But it's, uh, yeah. There's something about it that I don't know what it is. It, it, was, it was explaining, uh, was it, we call it, I call it Asprey math. Mm. It was like, I was eating oh, yeah. 4,500 calories. At, Asprey math. I let that go. <laughs> I was like, man, I need to start mainlining bacon grease, man. Cause I, there's a secret way that math and uh, thermodynamics don't work yeah. if you just do it. And it's like, no, it's not a real thing. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like just basic. So I don't know, man. Like, well, it's amazing. I mean, I guess maybe there is some some parallels there because uh, what just tracking and uh, the the new awareness of that, right? Like, and I'm sure the conversation you had, you're probably telling Lane, like, I'm eating this and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And he's going, no, you're no, probably not. I promise and, you're not. And just yeah. like what I would say back is, you know, show me, you know, let me see. And then I'll, yeah. then I'll break it down to you why you're not. And I remember the first, the, the first time I had that realization. So we've all been doing this long enough that all the cool tech wasn't there. <laughs> you know, we had to do it long <laughs> On a piece form. of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you had to guess, you know, like, yeah, yeah. oh, that's about this much or yeah, this. Yeah. And, you know, and I had the same thing. I actually believed it was steroids. I thought like the only thing that separates me from that guy is like he's on all kinds of steroids and uh, yeah. that's why i can't have that body it's like and then all of a sudden this tool came out it was like in i don't know 2004 or whatever uh it was called the body bug it was like the first like like you know semi-accurate metabolism reader you can okay. yeah track how many calories my body with, with pr pretty good accuracy like 90 something percent 
And it blew my mind. Like, holy cow, I am burning so much because I'm moving all day long. I'm training. Wow. I love basketball. I love snowboarding. I love weight. I'm doing all these active things. And I'm not eating enough. And I think because I'm I'm force feeding myself and I'm pounding shakes afterwards and I'm, I'm not building any more muscle. But then when I actually sat down and did the math, it was like, whoa, yeah, okay. So I had three days mm -hmm. of good surplus like I need to be if I want to gain and build. But then I had two days where I was dramatically, I don't know, that was enough mm -hmm. to cancel out the yeah. average. So And I had the reverse. Um, and man, it was like I had to kind of mourn it for a minute, I grieve it for a second. But it's been like a time machine the amount I was consuming versus what I was, the time I was putting in the gym, it's like, just stop eating so much, man. <laughs> and you actually get an hour of your life back to go be with your family. It was this, oh my, it was a time machine. I don't have to run. I don't have yeah. to like, like, oh, this, my pants are getting tight again. That shirt doesn't fit. Yeah. I got to start on another th six weeks of working out like an idiot. Or, <laughs> right, have no donuts. Yeah, yeah and ta-da, yeah, yeah. it, it, it was uh, it was the reverse of that. Well, yeah. I mean, I have that same story too. That was the thirty plus version of me. <laughs> we were just telling the story of the twenty to thirty version of me of like trying to build and get. Yeah, to become. Yeah. I was a skinny kid who tried to build and couldn't for the life of me. Gotcha. And then I couldn't make that connection. And then later, and then yeah, I had if more the, people did house chores and active things around their house. Yeah. They would never have to jump on a treadmill. That's right. Yeah. You just get busy, be active, do, do all that. Yeah, yeah, go lift weights for sure. But it, I, that to me is like one of those things. Like, why are you wasting all this time running nowhere? Yeah, by yourself. I had one of those straps once, and uh, I had it for about six weeks. And it, I remember doing the yard. Like, I live on some. We were mowing and doing all kinds of. Yeah. And workout. it was like my Way more greatest workout. workout ever. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Like, oh, just doing Saturday yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. John, get after it, John. Yeah. What makes a good, uh, a really good, effective counselor and therapist, uh, and what makes a really effective client or patient Dude, like, what are the question. what are the things that like will make you a good counselor and also will make you a good somebody can go to counseling and get good results for a good counselor is somebody who knows out the gate i'm not your friend like you've hired me um is a professional and who is invested in you getting well not me trying to pass along one of my techniques to you gotcha right mm -hmm. Um, and a good client is somebody who shows up number one out of the gate don't go to counseling if you're not going to tell the truth if you're not going to talk about, here's what my week looks like. Here's the addictions that I have. Here's how many people I've slept with, even though I'm married to somebody. If you're not going to be honest, don't go. You're wasting everybody's time um, to get to the, the core of some of those issues. So show up and tell the truth and then be on time. And then whatever homework assignments, like model this, journal this. It's the same as keeping up with Cal. Like, do the work. It's literally, do what, the work, man. It's literally what makes a good trainer and a good client. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I asked that question. <laughs> it's, it's, exactly. it's, 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 it's the exact verbatim. same thing. I wanted to see yeah. if it was the same thing. It's almost yeah. verbatim. Yeah, it yeah. totally is. So, so when somebody goes to counseling or sees a therapist because they're forced, mm -hmm. like spouse says, you better go or I'm going to leave you, yeah. or you know, the order to... Um, probably way like less effective. Yeah. It's just as, as as effective as the spouse who sends the husband yeah. to go lose 30 yeah, pounds 30 and to get pounds, a trainer. Yeah. You know or that. the other way, right? Like, yeah. I cheated on you. Why? Well, I'm not attracted to you anymore. You need to lose 30 pounds or I'm out of here. Yeah. That guy's not going to be a good <laughs> client. No. Or maybe he will. Yeah. But she's going to leave him anyway. Yeah, like yeah. That's not why. And that, it'll even only yeah. be a temporary fix even if you do fix it. It's, yeah, it's not the issue. Yeah, yeah. 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 What, do, what do you see with, because there's been this, I mean, and this maybe happened um, a little bit during the sexual revolution, but you're seeing it happen a lot more now where people are trying to make the argument that monogamy, mm -hmm. staying loyal to somebody like, oh, that's, uh, you know, like that's archaic. because of the agricultural revolution yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's not, you know, humans, we need to the be ethical open. Ethical non-monogamy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you really love your spouse, like you want them to have pleasure and be with <laughs> lots of people. Yeah. And we've heard all those are yeah. like, it, it, is that, what is that? Is that madness? Is, okay. Yeah, just madness. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I mean it. Um, it's it's yeah, it's madness. What is the data? I mean, what does the data show on? I mean, I there's look, very I know. very little. Um, okay. It's I, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'll step on some toes here. Probably I looked I looked early on at Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until very very late in that deal that uh, Nassim Taleb and, and uh, Warren Buffett, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them were like, if you just chart it, it ends in zero. <laughs> it's not a thing. <laughs> and it was, it was Buffett right before it crashed. It came out and said, I wouldn't buy all of it for 25 bucks because to be able to use it, I would have to turn and sell it back to you. And so it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. I invest in things like gas and railroad. Like I invest sure. in things that create things. And so this feels very much like I am 
unable to, I have created a set of feelings or emotions that I've attached to the word uh, right or that feels good. And if you stop meeting my feel good, I've got to go get that somebody else. If you really love me, you would want me to, right? And it's like, okay, you know what I mean? It's this weird Mm -hmm. A plus B equals R equals T equals, it's just the math doesn't work in it. So we can look at the data all day long and the studies. You can just step back and say, yeah, that's madness. It's madness, right? Yeah. Well, it, I, I mean, Sex at Dawn tries to make the case that we, this was our natural evolution to be that way, but we've, we have progressed from that. And I, we've talked, to, I don't think we've talked on air about this, but we've talked off air for sure. And I actually think it was you who brought it up that I think was one of the more brilliant ways to explain it. Cause you talked about, uh, you know, in a society where every, everyone is okay to sleep with everyone, what ends up happening is a small percentage of men get all the women and that ends up causing, an More uprising from the men that aren't getting yeah, any, they, they can't have families, can't have yeah. pleasure, can't have, mm. and they end up killing off. <laughs> though, and that, and then you turn into this society of everyone's society killing each implodes. other because mm. a very small percentage of men are getting all of well, the women also, and, and we would not evolve as a, a society. There's also value, I think, in like, um, I could make the case that it's in our nature to eat whatever tastes good in front of us. Dopamine, right? You can right. go read uh, uh, Judd Brewer stuff, right? Dopamine evolved when we walked under an apple tree and it put a GPS pin. There's an apple tree down that path, right? And so we just, yes, we have evolved to eat everything we see. Right. And now there's everything. Yeah. Right. And so we have to develop. Same with pornography, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, So that, you know, that's what I would, that's what I would say. And also, um, you know, being married and being monogamous, I think there's, are there trade-offs? I mean, I guess you could call it a trade-off. Yeah. I can't just go sleep with whoever I want, but I think the trade-offs worth it. I mean, the growth you get from, from committing to somebody like that's tremendous. Well, what value and John, what value does abstaining and sacrifice give to us? It, that's, that's, I never thought of that, but it's this, it's the uh, intermittent fasting community combined with the ethical non-monogamy, right? <laughs> it's like, I need to, like my body really grows from like restriction and restraint and boundaries mm-hmm. But I need to have no boundaries, and right, it, yeah. it, the, the, it's not an intellectually uh, congruent argument. Mm. Um, yeah, you grow, you grow from boundaries, and at the end of the day, this is not a popular psychological sentiment, but we, our bodies crave boundaries. What's the, our kids especially, but adults sure. do too, mm-hmm. right? When you tell your employee, like, just do a good job, that's not helpful, man. Mm-hmm. And then you come home and you I mean, you get get to the office and it's pissed because it's not cleaned up like you wanted it, and the videos aren't edited like you want. The greatest thing you can give your employees is clarity, right? The greatest thing I can give my wife is here's what I need right now. And here's how I can help meet your needs and you help meet my needs, right? We get in this dance. The challenge is, is hard, man. You can tell me all day long, like you'll feel better and you'll look good if you lift weights and you lose weight and you do these things. I've got to trust you because I've not been there, right? right? Celebrating 20 years of marriage, we went out, we took a week and went and did some cool stuff and went hiking and had fun. My 25-year-old me would have never believed in a million years. You're not going to believe what kind of fun y'all are going to have on your 20th anniversary. My 35-year-old me for sure wouldn't have believed that. Mm -hmm. My 40-year-old would have thought I was kind of sketchy, right? We had to go through some hard, hard stuff to get to this place. And so that meant sacrificing feelings. That meant, I mean, putting some of that nonsense aside and doing the hard work moving forward. So I, it just feels like, uh, like we're, we're obsessed with hacks. I just don't think they, I don't think there's hacks. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I'd be more interested as, as a counselor. Um, if you feel like you need to go, you're married to this person and you feel like you need to go sleep with other people. Let's have that conversation. What is it that's missing here? What is this person? What are you bringing to this? I want to have that conversation more than, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, you know? now traditionally those people have learned that um, through um, spiritual practices, mm-hmm. religion. It's yeah. traditionally taught us these types of things, but that's on the big decline. Like, like yeah, Esther Perel talks about that. She does a phenomenal job of talking about right, wrong, or indifferent. Religion gave all of us an anchor, like you talked about. Like, it gave us an anchor. Y'all wear this, y'all don't wear this. Here's your role, here's your roles. And often those were abused, right? So let's sure. let's call that out. But everybody could breathe. Everybody knew Right. And now we've taken all that. It's fallen off the map. We've pulled the plug on all the, whether they were combining myths, or whether they're religion or whether whatever you believe, we pulled the thread on all of that. And now everybody's untethered. 
And that's when you get a culture that chases its feelings, when you're not tethered into a central story that we're all we're mm -hmm. all part of, right? Yeah, what's that's, that? That's a scary proposition. That, I was just going to say, what's that quote? Um, before you tear down a fence, you got to figure out why it was up in the first place. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I like, like this. The uh, I don't know. I saw this the other day, but instead of burning everything down, what if you built new things over time that made those old things obsolete? Mm -hmm. That's a harder, more challenging, and ultimately better way. Anybody can burn something it's to the more ground. Productive, that's yeah. easy. Yeah, um, but that's not lasting. Yeah, right. yeah, and there, I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, there were some famous psychologists who predicted some of the rises of totalitarian, you know, superpowers and whatever because of the decline of religion. Where people yeah. just start worshiping other things. So I think it's You're, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, what's the? It's the. Uh, oh gosh, I just lost him. The great author, Jung, In, Infinite Jest. Thinking. No, who wrote Infinite Jest? Um, oh, I can't think of it. And no, he gave he gave the great right speech. Uh, this is water. David Foster Wallace. Okay. Um, there's no such thing as an atheist. You worship something. Yeah. yeah. You worship yep. something. And so you get to pick. But if you worship feelings, that bar moves for you all the time. Mm -hmm. You can never chase that. Are you down. seeing more of that now? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because that's, that's the, that's the, if you, we have pathologized discomfort, right? We've made it the enemy. Wow. That's a great, that's so <laughs> true. In an effort to, um, like there's no value in discomfort. It's the thing to be solved. Yeah. Like, if you are uncomfortable, it means there's a problem. We're trying to solve aging now, right? As though it's a, as a glitch in the matrix instead of as a, as a boundary, as an operating. It's, it's part of the sidewalk that we walk on, right? It's like, nah, we can solve that. We can fix that too. I don't want to solve that, man. I want to ride out and call it good. My granddad, he was a World War II vet, had four kids, great man, worked at the same Houston Power and Light for however many years. He's just that guy. They gave him a gold watch, the whole thing. Great human. He showed up to my punk rock shows when I was a kid, stood in the back like this, and just, I mean, in a suit. Like, he was just awesome, man. 93, he was in his uh, retirement home with my grandmother. 72 years they were married. He got up to go to another room and just died. He got to, was it Sisson said, he got to fall down dead. And I was talking to somebody, and they were talking about, uh, like, what a tragedy. And I stopped him and said, no, man. He was 93. He lived an incredible life, has great kids. My little boy got to crawl up on his casket and put a rose there, like four generations of Deloney. Like, it wasn't a tragedy. It's the way it is, right? And we have to stop pathologizing. Everything is uncomfortable. Uh, we're going to end up, what's that Pixar movie? We're going to end up like just- Oh, oh gosh. Wally. -E. -E. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, as <laughs> we reference that all the time, hey, listen, that we're heading that direction. As a fitness Dude, and health so expert, many... watching that, I remember getting the yeah. chills and be like, oh, this, oh, this is, is it. uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 It's too yeah. spot on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting. We had this conversation about aging because, you know, there's people in our space who are like, yeah. oh, we can solve it. We can fix it. I'm like, man, we are playing with, we don't even know. Humans have never lived forever. We have no idea what effects that'll have on our psyche and if it'll make us crazy or make us, who knows? Yeah, yeah. We have no idea. I have no interest I, in that. I think in our lifetime, we talked about this on the show not that long ago. In our lifetime, I think we are going to see a time where we, you can, everyone will have almost everything they want. 3D printers are not that far around the corner. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, everyone's, and the, the irony of that is I predict that we will be more depressed, more anxiety, more suits, more than we've ever had. And yet, We'll have all the things that we all we all. A hundred percent of the anecdotal data. The more comfortable our cars get, the faster they yeah. are, the quicker our internet connections. Everything globally suggests that we're getting more and more depressed and anxious. This, we're, get, we're getting fried. This is also why we, we theorize the uh, the rise of races like uh, Spartan and obstacle races because we, we our human instinct Desperate. is we want that. Yes. We want, if you could just be, could you imagine being, uh, you know, 200 years ago, someone down your, your family tree, you dropped into this time and then see that people like, are, why pay, are you doing are, pay, are paying oh. to crawl under barbed wire and to, to swim in freezing well, the cold same water. Same as having to create gyms I'm, when yeah. back in the day, they just had hard labor to, yeah. to get through. And I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't have fought my granddad at 75. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he like moved fence posts. Like, yeah, like yeah. he didn't go to a gym a single day in his life. But no. but we've had to create it to to keep up with our, with our lives. And I don't want to bag, I don't want to go back to the 1800s, right? Right, right. Um, I think it comes back to what you're talking about with ethnom, ethical non-monogamy. You can go down this thing of what feels good, what feels good and pathologize discomfort. It's really uncomfortable to sit across from your wife and say, I screwed up, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not attracted to you anymore. And that's a me problem and you're contributing. Like, that's hard, man. It's sure. gut-wrenching. 
And if it goes sideways, you lose Christmases are different, right? You lose your faith community. You lose your home, like your friends have to split up, right? It's a mess. It's hard. And that doesn't mean it's wrong, right? right. And so lean into that discomfort. That's that's become the thing in our house is let's take the most uncomfortable path. Mm. My wife's like, Do we, mm-hmm. we've got to be on time. Can we please be on time? Okay. But, uh, <laughs> which is right. But um there's something about seeking it now. Almost, yeah. I'm almost pathological the other way. Yeah, this is why yeah. we. This yeah. is why. This is why we think that, that when they finally, because they will, I'm sure, mm-hmm. invent exercise in a pill. It ain't going to give people all mm-hmm. the benefits of exercise. Maybe they'll lose weight and they'll get fit. Dude, they, we gave people relationships on a little box. Yeah, yeah, and it's making us lonelier than ever. Yeah, you're yeah. not going to get exactly. You're not going to get. Okay, so let me ask you guys this: Y'all work in a space where, conceivably, I can go pick up a rock. And I can run around my neighborhood and I can just quit eating. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're in a multi billion dollar industry, mm-hmm. right? Um, is it be what perpetuates the next fitness machine? I did so I was in the in the hotel gym this morning and I was like, well, I don't even know what this machine is. It was oh. like a, what perpetuates but, it? But is is it this idea that it's money. That's, that's it's what I mean. Easy money. There's no it doesn't seem to be any We're preying on insecurities of yeah. people. And, okay. and 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 by selling them new ideas, it's like one of the th- motivations behind the show. Listen, we have that, so that's ethical non monogamy, right? That's all those like yeah. that's put on like you'll find you'll find it over there. You'll oh, find it over there. We had this, no, you'll find it right here. We had a, a right. an equipment manufacturer. I don't want to call them out because we did so much already on, on the show, but <laughs> they they created this advanced piece of exercise mm-hmm. equipment. It goes in your house. They got this billion dollar valuation. All of us laughed because we're like, no, it ain't going to be worth that much. That. <laughs> and he came in and tells us how it's going to change. No, you don't understand. This is how look, people stick to this way longer than any of the former exercise because they got data and technology and it's great and it's convenient. And all of us who've been doing this forever, like, no, nope, it's going to follow the same path it's dumbbells, temporary. bands, machines. And sure <laughs> enough, it's yeah. not the root cause. It's not the root cause. Yeah. So, I, w- so what's the root cause? Well, oh boy. You, we, you know, I know I'm supposed to be on your show. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get into this, but it's, it's, we are. We're looking at things like it's numbers and forgetting that we're behavior-based emotional creatures. So it's relational. That's it. It's not just do this, do that. If it was that easy, I would have shit. I would have been a successful trainer year one when I gave people meal plans and exercise programs. And I would have been the most successful trainer of all time. It doesn't work that way. And it's also not motivation. Motivation ain't ain't it because that comes and goes. So what the fitness space does is they they take your insecurities. You're it's insecure, easy money. And, and I'm going to hype and motivate you because everybody loves that feeling and then buy my product and then we're done. Mm-hmm. And it just doesn't work. I Fail mean, that, that is literally the model in our space is gain a network, whether that be through, you know, you were famous on TV, on radio, on magazines. Or you look hot or whatever. Yeah, get gain that's, the attention. That's the one I lean into. <laughs> yeah. gain, gain the attention and then you sell a product. You, and, and, and most, uh, ideally, a consumable. So supplements are the go-to. Okay, then, what's what's the mechanism? And I'm sure this obviously is behavioral and psychological in origin. What's what's? I knew better, but yet you still do. I I'll I, I'll be that. I had two PhDs. I know how to read data. I know how to read science. Yeah, and I was the guy like putting two cups of MCT oil in my coffee yeah. and mm-hmm. I would well, cook bacon and pour the grease. Really in good marketing. It's because the science still gets you because it, there is some, it, it's, it's rooted in some truth. There is some like, and that's how we, do, this is how we talk about supplementation on the show. I mean, we're, we're, we have partnerships and mm-hmm. sponsors that yeah. sponsor show that are that, but we're very careful about how we talk about that. It's not the big rock. It's, it's not, major in the minors. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So it's like, yeah. and we, and we'll tell people when we're answering questions, like, listen, if you got shitty relationships, you ain't sleeping good, you eat like shit, and you don't train consistently, what the fuck are you doing <laughs> taking MCT oil? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, save like your money. A, it's like putting a spoiler on a, you know, 1987 Honda <laughs> Civic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It ain't going to do much, man. It's, You're not going to go yeah. faster. <laughs> but yeah, and but it does get it does get some of us science nerds. We're all, because we all went through our, yeah, our yeah, supplement yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, you read this, and, oh, man, it gives you 5% yeah. edge. And it's like, all I got to do is throw it in my mouth. I get 5% more of some things. But right. it's like, when you but really we're not, think we're about also it. not working on the root cause, which is a long. You know why we chose podcasting as our number long one medium? Form. It's a conversation. Yeah, yeah. human interaction. It's yeah. a conversation. Huh. I I, I got to talk about. I used to have to talk about fat loss with a client for years yeah. mm-hmm. before it really before they really developed a relationship with it where they do would do it forever. Mm. It, it it was a conversation. It was a constant conversation. Yeah, it would take different think, forms. Yeah. It wasn't a blog or an Instagram article. You know, picture. so relationally speak. Because we're in a new space with podcasts because they're brand new. Yeah. And that goes back to the thing we're talking about, violence and pornography. The idea that I could be 
have access to this conversation yeah. without being in the room has never existed before. Right. Yeah. right. And now somebody is mowing their yard or vacuuming their house or going for a run with headphones as though they're sitting right here. Mm-hmm. And part of their brain acknowledges they're sitting right here. Yeah. You probably meet people and they're like, what's up? And they oh, like, yeah, well, they know yes. like we're, yeah. that was a wild thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I should have uh, mentioned yeah. that earlier. Yeah. Like that was been weird. I'm going to the bathroom in an airport and someone's well, asked me about my son. I'm like, whoa, dude. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's kind of weird. But, um, I forgot I was going with that. Well, you know, you know, gonna change your world. But you know, who, who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jordan Peterson said it really well about man. that. Wait for it. Yeah, in the past, media was limited. The bandwidth was limited. We had mm-hmm. channels and you, you had to be fast, get people's attention. And there were only so many channels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. bandwidth is unlimited now. Yep. And so what it's done is it's made. Uh, so books have always been very powerful mm-hmm. because you could convey like, you know, how hard it is to take a movie and uh, uh, take a book and turn it into a movie. Mm-hmm. It's never the same yep. because with a book, you could really paint. An incredible story. But more important, my wife is a, uh, she teaches reader response theory, right? Teaches kid, she teaches teachers how to teach kids how to read. Okay. So her thing is literacy. What she taught me was, you bring your story to a book. Sure. And it becomes a personal yes. conversation mm. between you and the, the author. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is different. And here's what I was saying about podcasting. You guys have given people access to relationship even though it's not full, they're not in here, right? There's a pseudo relationship. Mm -hmm. And because they're in relationship with you guys, they trust you. And when they trust you, then I'll, all right, cool. Yeah. And it's also, you know, I'll I'll stop. It's also an hour, two hours of a conversation. And we get to have this conversation five days a week and you can listen. And it's Mm. a process. I'm not going to tell you in a blog or an article in a picture, what it is you need to know or understand to go from I'm 30 pounds overweight to I figured this out forever. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. ain't going to happen. It's a conversation. It's a process. Yeah, yeah. We're in a bit of a war though, because I feel like the, there's yes. a, a two extremes here. Cause as, as the bandwidth extends and we have the ability to do yeah, these long form conversations, stuff, yeah. then you have the other complete opposite side, which is TikTok, which is now catching Google as far as the number one search yeah. engine that it is, you know, 15 seconds and so you've got it's both yeah you have yeah. a you have a split audience mm-hmm. of people that but consume their information kind, through this long form but kind of like you guys were talking about looking at that at that uh exercise equipment like i don't care what your evaluation is it's not gonna last mm-hmm. it was back in 2012 i think 2013 when it kind of quietly came out of this community that the ceos the major players of some of these big tech companies weren't letting their kids touch the stuff yeah yeah, yeah. and that was the old RJ Reynolds stuff. Like we don't smoke. That stuff's crazy, Yeah, but we're selling it. And that tells me that I don't care how big it is now. The arc on it is failure. Yeah. It can't be until it becomes something that I would give my kid. Mm -hmm. Right. right? And you know it when the creators of it are like, dude, I'm gonna let my kids play on this. Or when the home country cuts it off at a certain time at night, because we know what this does to, right. Yeah. The arc on it is, is in ash, right? It can't be. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, um, you're great to talk to you. Man. I know. Thanks for keep out, going. What a great, yeah, 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 it's such great conversation. I love talking to you. You got great. I mean, I appreciate y'all hanging out, man. Your content is so valuable. Like I am for our audience. So much like, needed right check now. Out, Thanks, man. Check this guy out. He's, he, he communicates so well. You hit on topics I think that can affect cool. almost anybody. Um, and I, I appreciate you coming on. It's been very valuable. Yeah, great Dude, time. I'm really grateful, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, man. Right on. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.